so uh, while uh, Brother Revisiting is going through and finishing, uh, we'll just go through quickly I mean, how we're going to organize in terms of time. So the opening statements will be 15 minutes. Uh, Brother Omar will start, followed by 15 minutes. Uh, Brother no, no, it, uh, it's, I'm, I'm the one starting because uh, I'm okay. the one challenging him on this. So I will so you're start. switching it? Okay. okay. Yeah, so there's a switch there. Okay, so it's the first 15 minutes, Brother Muhammad. No interruptions, inshallah. Then follow up 15 minutes, Brother Omar. Then we'll go on to the next the stage rebuttal one. It'll be 10 minutes instead of 15 minutes, same order. Rebuttal two, 15 minutes, uh, same order. 10 minutes as well. So 15, 10, 10. And then the last, the third stage will be 20 minutes cross-examination. 15 minutes, then 15 minutes. And then we'll continue that way, inshallah. So who is the timekeeper? Aziz, are you keeping the time? I can do that, yeah. Who, who would, is someone better equipped? Do you guys tell me? No, no, I think you should, Aziz. Inshallah. So when you're ready, I'm ready. Give me two seconds. Uh, should I go on? <clears throat> so, Brother Muhammad, you have 15 minutes. Go ahead. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين به نستعين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الخلق سيدنا ونبينا وحبيبنا أبو القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين وعلى صحبه الأبرار المنتجبين. So the topic of this debate is to prove whether Abu Bakr's Khilafah was legitimate or not. I am of the view that his Khilafah was not legitimate. It was not based on Quran and Sunnah. And my opponent here, Omar, he is, you know, to refute me and to prove that his Caliph actually had a legitimate uh, caliphate or khilafa. So to know the basis of what makes anything or anyone legitimate in Islam, it has to be based on the Holy Quran. So I will cite a few verses in order to shed light on what is the meaning of Sharia. When we are talking here of legitimacy, we are talking of the Sharia of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, the first Sunni uh, Caliph. So I'm going to quote Holy Quran 42 verse 13. He has ordained for you of religion what he enjoined upon Noah and that which we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, and what we enjoined upon Abraham and Moses and Jesus to establish the religion and not to be divided therein. Difficult for those who associate others with Allah is that to which you invite them. Allah chooses for himself whom he wills and guides to himself whoever turns back to him. That's the first verse. Second verse, Surah Yunus, verse 40. You worship not besides him except mere names. You have named them. You and your fathers, for which Allah has sent down no evidence. Legislation is not but for Allah. He has commanded that you worship not except him. That is the correct religion, but most of the people do not know. The third verse is Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 44. Indeed, we send down the Torah in which was guidance and light. The prophet who submitted to Allah, judged by it for the Jews, has did the rabbis and scholars by that with which they were entrusted of the scripture of Allah, and they were witnesses thereto. So do not fear the people, but fear me, and do not exchange my verses for a small price. And whoever does not judge by what Allah has revealed, then it is those who are the disbelievers. Then the last verse is Surah 5, Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 49. And judge, O Muhammad, between them by what Allah has revealed, and do not follow their inclinations. And beware of them, lest they tempt you away from some of what Allah has revealed to you. And if they turn away, then know that Allah only intends to afflict them with some of their own sins. And indeed, many among the people are defiantly disobedient. The Prophet ﷺ has ordered us to follow his sunnah and the sunnah of the rightly guided and rightly guided caliphs. In, Sun in Sunan Ibn Majah, and this will constitute my first exhibit, it was narrated from Abdul Rahman bin Amr al-Sulami that he had Al-Irbad bin Sariya say, the messenger of Allah delivered a moving speech to us, which made our eyes flow with tears and made our hearts melt. We said, O messenger of Allah, this is a speech of farewell. What did you enjoin upon us? He said, I am leaving you upon a path of brightness whose night is like its day. No one will deviate from it after I am gone, but one who is doomed. Whoever among you lives will see great conflict. I urge you to adhere to what you know of my sunnah and the path of the rightly guided caliphs and cling stubbornly to it. And you must obey, even if your leader is an Abyssinian leader. 
For the true believer is like a camel with a ring in its nose. Wherever it is driven, it complies. It is therefore apparent that the caliph has a religious role and his sunnah is one to be emulated and follow. Therefore, his rule must be established by the religion and in the religion. My opponent will have to therefore present clear proofs that the position of his caliph, namely Abu Bakr, and his caliphate have religious bases, that he was either appointed by the prophet or whatever means was used to appoint him has bases in the religion, in the Quran, or sunnah. Failure to do so will indicate either an incomplete and imperfect religion or a man-made religion, which is legislated and imposed by certain rulings, methodologies, and systems upon Sunnis, which did not come from Allah and his messenger. In light Sayyid, of the statement... Sayyid, apologies, apologies. Sardar, are you actually posting the links? Because people on Discord are saying you're not sharing the links there. It's Elias sharing the I links. Can I can stop the yeah. time. No, Elias is not Sorry. sharing the links there. No, he's not. No, no, it is, it is. Elias is sharing you're the sure? links, Sayyid. Yeah, 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 I, he shared the link now. Okay, that's fine, uh, because you, you do have the links as well, right? So Yeah, yeah, I have the links. Share. I have the links, bro. All right, that's fine. So whenever the Sayyid says exhibit, it's one of those links that you share. Okay, so it's all okay. Go on, Sayyid, please. Yeah, sorry, Sayyid, apologies. Just because uh, some brother... Okay, I hope I did stop the time, so, you know, I my time it. will not... I did stop it. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so, Going in light of the stated hadith, number 43 in Sunan Ibn Majah, it is incumbent on my opponent to prove how Muslims can identify, recognize, and know, and appoint rightly guided caliphs and rightly guided caliphs, or were they appointed by Nas? If not, then what legitimizes them as caliphs and what gives them the merit to be called rightly guided and rightly guided caliphs? And if a caliph misguides and leads people astray and cause tyranny and bloodshed and commit oppression by shedding the blood of Muslims, can we still regard him as rightly guided or a caliph at all? Definitely, a clear methodology must be available in the religion to identify and obey and appoint such caliphs in order that their rule be considered to be sharia, legitimate. Otherwise, they will be regarded not as imams guided by the commands of Allah as per verse 2173 and verse 3224. Rather, they will be imams guiding to the hellfire as per verse 2841. The opponent must therefore prove that his caliph was an imam of guidance and not misguidance leading to the fire, and how he was chosen must be established to be in line with the religion and as per the dictates of the religion and not the hawa of the nafs. Sahih Muslim 1851a. This is my second ev uh, exhibit. It has been reported on the authority of Nafi' that Abdullah ibn Umar paid a visit to Abdullah ibn Mu'ti in the days when atrocities were uh, perpetrated on the people of Medina at Harra in the time of Yazid ibn Muawiyah. Ibn Mu'ti said, place a pillow for Abu Abdul Rahman the family name of Abdullah bin Umar, but the latter said, I have not come to sit with you, I have come to you to tell you a tradition I had from the Messenger of God. I had him say, one who withdraws from his band, one who withdraws his band from obedience to the Amir will find no argument in his defense when he stands before Allah on the day of judgment. And one who dies without bound, having bound himself by an oath of allegiance to an Amir will die the death of one belonging to the death of, of to the days of Jahiliyyah. In Sahih Bukhari 1753, this is my third exhibit. Whoever disapproves of something done by his ruler, then he should be patient. For whoever disobeys the ruler, even a little, a little span will die as those who died in the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. To support my argument further, I shall present to you how prominent Sunni scholars have interpreted the station of Khilafah and its importance in the deen. Ibn Abdul Bar, this is my fourth exhibit from Ma'rifat al-Sahaba, volume three, page 968. He said, he described the Khilafah as a pillar from among the pillars of the religion. In Tafsir al-Qurtubi, this is my exhibit five, volume one, page 265. Under the Tafsir of verse 230, I will make caliph on the earth. Al-Qurtubi has stated that it has been made clear that Khilafah has been shown to be obligatory and a pillar from among the pillars of religion. Imam of Sunnis, Taqiyyid Din al-Subki stated, that Abu Bakr and Umar are a fundamental aslun after the Prophet. There is no doubt whoever doubts their caliphate is a kafir. In other words, you know, he is basically I'm a kafir because I don't believe in his caliphate. So according to Subki, he went on to state in the Hanafi fatwas, denying the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar makes one a kafir. And some of the Hanafis say he is a mubtadi, innovator, and the correct view is that he's a kafir. This is Exhibit 6, Fatwa, Fatawa as Subki, Volume 5, page 567, sorry, 576. Can you pause it, please, please? Can you pause if you don't mind? Okay, can you hear me? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so what exhibit? What exhibit so, Lord, one second, one second. Uh, uh, which uh, exhibit are you on? Uh, exhibit six. Okay. Fatawa okay, just give me a second because the other ones need to be refreshed. So just bear with me, okay? Say it, say it, by the way, by the way, again, so the Shia brothers or the Sunnis who are there, please stop texting there, bro. The, this is only for the reference. So stop like doing chats there. Can I go on, please? Aziz, I hope you stop the time. Say, so, so you need yeah. to wait because I need to pin these links up. So just give me a second, sorry. Because it's important that all these links are shared because it's on replay as well, right? So there can't be any deception from any party. Brother Muhammad, you still have nine minutes to go. Yeah, I mean, you used up nine minutes, sorry. Can I go on? Go ahead, Sean. Should I go on? Go ahead. 
Just please continue. Exhibit 6 can be paid now. Okay, Exhibit 6 from Subki, Volume 5, page 576 to 577. At Dahabi in Tazkirat Al Hufaz, Volume 2, page 202, Exhibit number 7. Whoever says Abu Bakr and Umar are not two Imams he mentioned, whoever says Abu Bakr and Umar are not, two, are not two Imams of guidance, should be killed. The Jews and the Christians do not accept the Prophet Muhammad as a true Prophet of God. And Allah in the Holy Quran 2946 said, And do not argue with the people of the Scripture except in a way that is best, except for those who commit injustice among them, and say, We believe in that which has been revealed to us and revealed to you and our God, and your God is one, and we are Muslims in submission to Him. Do we still wonder about? the root cause of terrorism and sectarian extremism and killings when we read and listen to those fatawas of takfirism and killing is the belief in abu Bakr and umar of higher importance that solicits more stringent punishment on anyone who refuses it or is the belief in the prophet muhammad of more importance it is very clear therefore that the position of abu Bakr was a religious one and embracing it was an was an obligation upon his followers and to top the icing on the cake abu huraira is quoted by the imam of the wahhabis muhammad ibn abdul wahhab in his book ikhtisar, ikhtisar sirat al rasul page 226 and by another wahhabi sheikh in the person of abdul aziz ibn abdullah al rajihi in his kitab sharh aqidat as salaf wa ashab al hadith if Abu, he said, if Abu Bakr did, uh, he's quoting Abu Huraira, if Abu Bakr did not succeed the Prophet, Allah will not have been worshipped. Allahu Akbar. That is exhibit number eight from Shaykh Abdul, Ab, uh, Abdul Aziz ibn Abdullah al Rajihi, Kitab Shah Haqidat al Salaf, wa Ashab al Hadith, volume 12, page 4. So the Sunnis have a clear, this, my, second, my second question or second section will have to do you know, with how, with asking actually, do Sunnis have a method on how to appoint a caliph with such, you know, impeccable qualities they believe Abu Bakr possessed that, you know, if you don't believe in Abu Bakr, you are a kafir. If you doubt his khilafah, you are this, you are that. So do Sunnis really have a method in, you know, selecting a caliph? Is there a method to choose the ruler or khalifa in Sunni Islam? And what method was used to choose Abu Bakr and the first three Sunni caliphs? So I will present to you, this is my further exhibit. This is exhibit number nine from Islam QA. There is a question on this, on how, you know, to choose the Muslim ruler or the Imam of the Muslims, the general Imam of the Muslim Ummah or the Caliph. How was he appointed? That was the question. So the Imam or the ruler, according to them, was appointed to lead the Islamic State by one of, th of three methods. He was chosen number one and elected by the decision makers who are known as the Ahlul Halli wal Iqad. For example, Abu Bakr became Caliph when he was elected by the decision makers. Then the Sahaba unanimously agreed with that and swore allegiance to him and accepted him as caliph. This is the first method which, you know, they have presented. So my question on this point would be, I would like a single verse from the Holy Quran or Hadith from the Prophet that legitimizes a band of so-called decision makers imposing a ruler or caliph over the Muslims. And who or what determines a decision maker? And is it binding upon the Muslims to have unanimous agreement? What if there is no unanimous agreement? Should they be killed? The second method that is presented by Islam QA, appointment to the position by the previous caliph. In other words, imposition. When one caliph passes on, the position to a particular person who is to succeed him after he dies becomes the responsibility of the previous caliph. They gave the example of Umar became caliph when Abu Bakr appointed him. My question again, I need a verse or hadith legitimizing this method of choosing a caliph, especially that according to the main view of Sunnis, the Prophet appointed no one. The third and most fantastic method of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah in choosing a Khalifa for the Muslim Ummah is number three, according to Islam QA, by means of force, tyranny, and prevailing over others. When a man becomes Caliph by prevailing over the people by the sword, and he establishes his authority and takes full control, then it becomes obligatory to obey him, and he becomes the leader of the Muslims. Examples of that include some of the Umayyad and Abbasid Caliphs and those who came after them. This method is contrary to Sharia ah because it is seized by force. But because great interests are served by having a ruler who rules the Ummah, and because a great deal of mischief may result from chaos and loss of security in the land. One sorry? Minute. Okay. The one who seizes authority by means of the sword should be obeyed if he seizes power by force, but he rules in accordance with the laws of Allah. So, in the above, it is clearly stated that, you know, this method is against the Sharia. And of course, the person will still be regarded as Khalifa al Muslimin, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Khalifa Rasulullah, obeying him is wajib and rising up against him is kufr. Unless, of course, you have more power to dethrone him, twist his neck and step on his head. Then enough power to subdue others legitimizes your rule. Then you become, you know, another tyrant who uses the force to establish his rule. So they went on to quote Sheikh Muhammad ibn Salih al-Uthaymin. He said, if a man rebels and seizes power, the people must obey him. Even if he seizes power by force and without their consent because he has seized power. The reason for that is that if his rule is contested, it will, read, it will lead to great evil. This is from Sharh Aqida al Safariniya, page 688. This is Exhibit 9 from Islam QA. To legitimize this same tyranny and oppression, Ahmad ibn Hanbal stated, and to hear and obey the Imams and the leader of the Muslims, whether he be righteous or wicked, and he who takes respons responsibility of the Khilafah and upon whom the Muslims are united and pleased with, as well as he who seizes control over them by the way of the sword until he becomes the, the Khalifa and is re referred to as the commander of the believers. So in other words, Ahmad ibn Hanbal is also justifying the use of force in somebody becomes in a Khalifa and he must be obeyed. This is from Kitab Usul al-Sunnah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, volume 1, page 21. So this is my exhibit 10. So was this anything other than, you know, what happened at Saqifah? We read in Musnad Ahmad on the precedence at Saqifah. There was a great deal of commotion and raised voices to such an extent that I feared there will be conflict. Okay, so, is my time up? Uh, Sayyid, you said, you said I... exhibit 10, but technically you actually exhibit 12. Um, if I recall, 
the last source you read was no I, I didn't uh, the aqidah safariniya that's that uh, reference is actually part of the link so it's not from me it's from the link it's from islam qa okay, <clears throat> okay. so uh, we will give uh, brother uh, super the 50 minutes 50 minutes uh let me know when you're ready i'll start the timer i'm ready inshallah okay sorry Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsan ila yawm al-deen Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa ahlil uqdatan min lisan yafqa wa qawli So I just want to give a, a small preface to my arguments, inshallah, it's not part of my actual argumentation I um, just wanted to discuss the topic a little bit, then inshallah we'll get into the issue um, So the khilaf of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, which is a topic of this debate and which is something that I affirm absolutely, uh, without a doubt um, There are various opinions uh, amongst the scholars of Islam regarding the haqam of the one who rejects the khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, the opinion that I follow is that Arath or rejection of his Khilafah in and of itself is not Kufr. Um, of course, as the, my opponent has mentioned, there are ulama who held this opinion. This is not the opinion that I hold. Um, and it's not the opinion that uh, many ulama from Ahlul Sunnah uh, hold. Um, if, but again, if somebody uh, believed in Nabu of the Prophet وسلم, and the Adal and the truth and the profound insight of the Prophet وسلم, they would have to be delusional to believe in you know, a conspiracy theory of mass apostasy of Sahaba who all give bay'ah to the illegitimate Caliph and how two people somehow overthrew the entire empire and, and, and Imams who can perform miracles and um, the entire, entire Arabian Peninsula, that would constitute a, a delusional or a schizophrenic belief, but that, that's not, again, schizophrenia and Islam are two different things, right? So that, that conspiracy theory aside, um, I don't believe that it, it takes you outside the fold of Islam to uh, uh, reject his khilafah. Um, this is just a matter of historical accuracy and, again, nothing considered schizophrenic. Uh, to be clear, uh, the present debate is a historical debate uh, that we're gonna, where we're going to use religious sources, inshallah, but it's not something that takes you outside the fold of Islam one way or the other. Um, I agree to have this debate, inshallah, because it was the only condition on which we're going to have a debate which actually has religious significance, right? Because uh, by ijma' of the scholars of, of Welverism, uh, if you reject one of, in fact, forget ijma' by clear nusus with uh, multiple chains from the allegedly infallible imams of Welverism, anybody who rejects any one of those imams is a kafir, clear cut. Yes, there's no such nas from the Prophet ﷺ which says that anybody who rejects the khilaf of Abu Bakr is a kafir, right? So um, there's a little bit of, a, of an asymmetry there. Um, inshallah, in, tomorrow you'll see um, a debate on, on an actually religious topic. This, this topic, inshallah, is just a matter of uh, historical and political accuracy. Um, now for my actual arguments, inshallah. Um, my argument is that the, the roles and the responsibilities and the scope of the office of Khilafah is outlined in Quran and Sunnah. Um, the specific medium of appointment is not, uh, or the single medium of appointment is not specified in Quran and Sunnah. Uh, and the Muslims are uh, free to appoint a Khilafah by whatever means they wish, uh, subject to a broad set of constraints uh, derived from the examples of those who live with the Prophet and Quran and Sunnah. Uh, to this end, um, I challenge my opponent as follows Bring from the Quran and Sunnah a divine command to this Ummah regarding the method by which a Khalifa is chosen. Right? So if you're going to say that, oh, the Prophet ﷺ is going to tell you who the successor is, and you all are obliged, the Ummah is obliged to give bay'ah to that one person, then, then this will satisfy the, the, the challenge. Uh, prove using authentic narrations that are uh, consistent with what I believe in, right? because you're, you challenged me to this debate. You're trying to prove an incoherency or an inconsistency in my worldview. You prove using authentic narrations in, in my corpus uh, how the rendition of Abu Bakr, uh, my rendition of Abu Bakr, anhu, his election, violates those constraints that were derived from Quran and Sunnah. And number three, uh, yeah, and, and that, that would be number three, to show how there's a contradiction uh, with those two things, what actually happened in what is outlined in Quran and Sunnah. Uh, my argument is simply that your inability to do that proves the legitimacy of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr as um, Again, although this would be sufficient for proving the legitimacy of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, I will also show how negating, negating the legitimacy of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu would entail a contradiction within your worldview, right? Uh, if, so, and I don't know, there's many um, opinions amongst the Rasa about with regards to how do you handle mutawatir narrations in the, in the books of uh, Ahl sunnah I don't know which opinion you follow. If a, if a, a narration is truly mutawatir in the books of Ahl sunnah do you reject it or not? But for me, uh, you would have to also address how to respond to, for example, Hadith al afdaliyah right? Where the Prophet, and I'm going to post that, inshallah, where Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu, praises Abu Bakr um, uh, profusely in no uncertain terms. Now, to in order to reconcile this, I would have to uh, say that Ali, radiallahu anhu, was lying or that uh, he was praising what Ayyadu Billah, an illegitimate caliph. And this is not conceivable. That, and I've just posted that. Uh, Ali radiallahu anhu said, uh, I'm going to go for the best of this ummah after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Bakr and Umar. Um, and again, this, this narration is, be, has, is beyond mutawatir. Um, we have uh, from Nahjul Balagha, Sermon 6, um, Ali radiallahu anhu, again, going over the, uh, the election of Abu Bakr, he says, Verily those who pledge allegiance to Abu Bakr, Umar, and Uthman have pledged allegiance to me on the same basis on which they have pledged allegiance to them where he who is present has no choice to consider, and he who is absent has no right to reject. And consultation is for the uh, Muhajirin and the Ansar. If they agree on an individual and take him to be caliph, it will be deemed to mean Allah's pleasure. This is from uh, Nahjul Balagha. Inshallah, I'm going to post the reference. And as we agreed, any reference should also be provided with the accompanying PDF. Um, so I will be providing that as well, because these are, again, the conditions that we agreed to. Um, as for my opponent's tangent about... Uh, as for my opponent's tangent about... 
uh, khilafa and kufr and all that. Again, that's not the topic of the debate. Again, like I, as I've already conceded, there's ikhtilaf on the issue of the hukum on the one who uh, rejects the khilaf of Abu Bakr. Some of the opinions of this country is kufr, and, and some um, say, that it, say that it does not. Uh, now, as for the evidences that my opponent uh, provided, we also agree that any evidence should be translated in English for it to be and posted. And there were a series of um, rules that we uh, agreed to. So, inshallah, I'm going to be responding to the evidences which he sent, which meet those uh, conditions. The first one from Sahih Muslim uh, 1851a. Um, it's a narration. Uh, I'll read it. Place a pillow of uh, Abu Abdul Rahman, uh, family name of Abdullah bin Umar. But the latter said, I have not come to visit you. I've come to tell you a tradition which I heard from the Prophet. I heard him say, One who withdraws his band uh, from obedience to the Emir will find no argument in his defense when he stands before Allah on the Day of Judgment. And one who dies without having bound himself by an oath of allegiance uh, will die the death of one belonging to the days of Jahiliyyah. Um, again, this does not preclude Abu Bakr from being the Khalifa. Uh, and if the argument here, is, or there's some kind of chaos going on where this applies to us and, and, and our rejection of uh, the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, again, this refers to the Khalifa of your time. Abu Bakr, may Allah have mercy on him, passed away many, many, many years ago, so he would not be considered the Khalifa of our time. This does not apply to us. Um, the second narration from Sahih al Bukhari, uh, narrated by Ibn Abbas, anhu, uh, the Prophet Muhammad says, Whoever disapproves of something done by his ruler, then he should be patient for, for whoever disobeys the ruler even a little. Uh, will die as those he died <coughs> in the pre-Islamic period of ignorance. Again, this does not preclude Abu Bakr Siddiq from being the Khalifa. If my opponent's uh, line of argumentation is that Sunnis have an incoherent uh, view of Khilafah, then, then that would be a different topic of, of debate, right? Whether or not these, these ahadith make sense or can be reconciled. But th these ahadith, none of these um, do any uh, help for my opponent in the way of proving the illegitimacy of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Um, so, so far, I've presented two arguments um, for the legitimacy of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr. Actually, three. Three arguments for the legitimacy of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, which is the first, first is the absence of evidence against him. The second is Hadith al and the contradiction that would ensue if we were to grant that Abu Bakr was an illegitimate caliph. Um, Five minutes. Thank you. Uh, number three is the evidence from Nahj al-Balagha, which I uh, referenced, where Ali radiallahu anhu legitimizes the Khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Um, mm -hmm. The last one, inshallah, is what I'm going to uh, cite from... Uh, uh, let's see. Um, from uh, trying to find the reference uh, from Dirasat fi Wilayat al Faqih, uh, Volume One, Page Five Hundred and Eight. I'm going to be posting the PDF as well as we agreed to. Um, we have uh, Al Muntazari says Ali radhiyallahu anhu said, uh, and the mandatory matter in the judgment of Allah and the judgment and judgment of Islam. And the PDF is there, so I'm, I'm meeting the requirements that we agreed to. Um, and the, man, and the mandatory matter in the judgment of Allah and the judgment of Islam over the Muslims after their uh, Imam dies or is killed is not. Uh, it is not from them to make an uh, event, nor innovate in an innovation, nor spread false beliefs. Rather, they are to pick for themselves a pious Imam, knowledgeable and pious, aware of the judiciary and the Sunnah, unites their affairs. So this is from this is from the books of Barakila, um, that to you are in the absence of divine appointment. Uh, shura is a perfectly uh, reasonable and valid method with which an Imam can be appointed. And again, this is consistent with what what uh, the Sunnah says. Um, and so, in fact, I've made a positive case for why the election of uh, Abu Bakr anhu does not violate anything from uh, the uh, conditions of even the Barakil and their, their Anamah. Let's see. We know uh, famously that uh, uh, we know famously that uh, Muhammad Jawad Mughniya says that all of Nahd al is um, consistent, uh, or sorry, authentic. So if my opponent wants to throw him out under the bus, inshallah, um, that would be great to have that on recording. Uh, my opponent throwing out his own scholars. Um, and yeah, I think, alhamdulillah, I've, uh, I've actually made my point. So, so just to recap, just one last time, I know I've already done that, but I, I do want my opponent to uh, respond to each of these points, and then, inshallah, we can, we can see like, w which uh, perspective is more coherent. Um, just to, to, to recap again, the first point is, if you are going to claim that the Khilafah of Abu Bakr anhu violates Qur'an and Sunnah, you have to do three things. Bring from Qur'an and Sunnah a divine, divine command regarding the method, the method by which a Khalifa is poisoned, uh, chosen, right? Derived from this set of constraints. Prove, using my sources, what actually happened, how was Abu Bakr anhu elected, and then show how those authentic sources violate the conditions that you made in point one from Quran and Sunnah. And that's the first argument that I made. Your inability to do that proves the, the legitimacy of Abu Bakr al -Hanu. That's the first thing. The second thing is the contradiction that would entail from uh, accepting Hadith al taliyah which has many, many, many chains which I've provided. And Ali radiallahu anhu, we both admit, is a righteous person capable of doing judgment to Adil. And his ta'adil of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is not consistent with the view that he, uh, he was an illegitimate caliph. Um, the third is from uh, Sermon 6 from Nahj al -Balakha. And then the fourth, finally, is... Uh, Wonderful. No problem. The force is from your books. Uh, alhamdulillah, we've shown that in the absence of uh, divine appointment, a divine command. Uh, uh, Brother Super Omar, so, sorry, bro, I don't want to interrupt you. I just got a few complaints from the audience. They're saying that, can you not do the Raddi? I don't know if that was agreed upon or not, but. No, no, that was, that was not agreed upon. It's, it's just political anyway, so it shouldn't make a difference, right? 
Yeah, brother, as you said one time, it was, uh, you know, if, if your opponent wants to waste 20 minutes doing Taraddi and Salawat and all that, that's on them, right? That's only a disadvantage to me. That is, that's just wasting my own time. Okay, but is it, is it necessary for you to do Taraddi? I mean, if, if it's just an issue of politics, can it not be left for... It is because, because Allah, no, because Allah did... No, no, so the Khilafah is an issue of, of politics, but his status is a, is, a, is a religious status because Allah does Taraddi on him in the Quran. So I will, I will do, I will, I will do Taraddi on the ones who Allah did Taraddi on. And that's beside the point. If I could just finish, I just have one last thing to say. Shall, which is, the, the fourth argument that I would like my opponent to respond to is that the system of Shura in the absence of divine appointment is consistent even from his own, from my opponent's books, as I, as I showed from his ulama. But uh, I yield the rest of my time. Uh, can I go on? <clears throat> Uh, Aziz, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Aziz, okay, should I go on? Uh, his brother, uh, Super, still has 30 seconds if he wants to finish a point. He has 30 seconds. Yeah, I just said, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, we, we proved that, alhamdulillah, the, 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 using these arguments for my opponent to respond and show why Abu Bakr, uh, alayhi salam, is not a legitimate caliph, inshallah, that would be appreciated. Thank you, brother. Uh, brother Muhammad, you can start your time. Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Allahumma salli ala Fatima wa abiha wa ma'liha wa biniha wa sirr al-mustawda'i fiha. So apparently, my friend here does not have any argument to defend the Khilafah of his Caliph, upon whom his, his salvation lies. If you don't know, the, if you don't have a bay'ah to a Caliph and you die, you die the death of Jahiliyyah, you have to follow according to the hadith I mentioned earlier on from Ibn Majah, you know, the first exhibit. If you don't know your Imam of the time, you die. It's, you, sorry, the, 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 the first exhibit was from Ibn Majah. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi, he's saying, you have to follow his sunnah and the sunnah of his rightly guided caliph. So now the question is, was Abu Bakr a rightly guided caliph? Was he somebody who was guiding people in the right way? Can we identify him as such? Because you cannot just tell me, you know, if you reject the caliphate of Abu Bakr, I wouldn't think it's kufr. When your scholars are saying it is kufr. So basically you have your own religion. And if you are rejecting what your scholars have said, it means that, well, I have my own religion and I don't care about the hadith which says if you don't have bay'ah on your neck to an amir and you die, you have died the death of Jahiliyyah. Basically, you're telling Sunnis, you know, let's go to the death of Jahiliyyah. You're taking your fellow Sunnis to the death of Jahiliyyah. This is what you're doing. And of course, then he went on, you know, blabbing about the issue of Nas. If you reject one of the 12 Imams, then you are a this is not This is not our topic, my friend. You're supposed to defend your Imam. You know, you always tell us, prove Imama from the Quran, but you cannot prove, this is what it means, you know, you said you don't have to prove the Khilafah of Abu Bakr from the Quran and Sunnah. It means it has no basis. This is what you're considering. It means it has no basis. If it has no basis, it means it is batil. What is batil? It means it is falsehood. This is what you're doing. You cannot defend the Khilafah of your Caliph, and you're here tasking the Shia with proving the, the Imama from the Quran. So you need to prove the Khilafah of your, this is your opportunity. Prove to us Abu Bakr has a basis, you know, in the Sunnah of Allah, in the Quran, and in the Sunnah of Rasulullah. If you cannot do this and you're just jumping about, then this is not, you know, this is not a defense of Abu Bakr's Caliphate. It means you have considered you cannot defend it. And of course, you know, he said Muslims can actually use whatever means in order to elect a leader. Well, no, this is, I, I'm going to show you what your scholars have said. It's all confusion. This is not what they say, that you can use whatever means. They have given contradictory means. They don't have one means. They haven't made up their mind because they don't know how. And this is, in con they contradict themselves. And this is on a matter that can they actually use to send other Muslims to hellfire. You know, if it is such a trivial issue, why do you call me a kafir if I reject him? Like, who is he? Is he your prophet? You know, and then it was like, he wants me, you know, to provide a method from the Quran on how to choose a Khalifa. Am I a follower of Abu Bakr? Of course, I'm not a follower of Abu Bakr. I'm not here to defend him. I don't think his caliphate has basis in the Quran. What has basis in the Quran is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choosing the Khalifa. It's not, you know, people gathering in Saqifah and using the sword to threaten one another, threatening each other with chopping off their heads. This is how your Khalifa was built, through ty tyranny and bloodshed. You want me to prove it for you? No, I'm not going to prove it for you because I don't believe it has basis. You know, and of course he mentioned letter six or Simon six from Nahjul Balagha. Habibi, you're telling me Mughni or whoever said everything in, wallah, you're lying. You're lying, this is a lie because Nahjul Balagha, in case you don't know and it's out of ignorance, you know, I may give you the benefit of the doubt. There is, there is actually an entire book that is called Masadir Nahjul Balagha wa Asanido. And this is by who? Abdul Zahra al Husseini al Khatib. A scholar has written an entire book on the sources and the chains of Nahjul Balagha. And this Simon 6, number one, it's a weak chain. It's not really from a Shia source. That's number one. Number two, guess what? It's actually placing Hujjah upon Muawiyah, telling him, you know, why you've been rebellious and disobedient. Just the way, you know, the previous people were recognized, you have to recognize me. So you just, you know, you have, you have no basis in all of your arguments. But, you know, I will continue in what I was trying to do. I ended at the point whereby, you know, Ahmad, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he was actually legitimizing tyranny. In my exhibit 10, in Kitab Usul al-Sunnah, Ahmad ibn Hanbal, in volume 1, page 21, he said what? He said, and to hear and obey the Imams and the leader of the Muslims, whether he be righteous or wicked, and he who takes responsibility of the Khilafah and upon whom the Muslims are united and pleased with, as well as he who seizes control over them by the way of the sod, until he becomes the Khalifa and is referred to as the commander of the believers. In other words, if somebody raises a sod and he, you know, he's powerful, 
you have to obey him, you know, oppression. So was this anything that different than what happened at, at the Saqifah? Of course not. My Exhibit 11 from Musnad Ahmad, Hadith number 391, there, it is actually stated in this Hadith, there was a great deal of commotion and raised voices to such an extent I feared there would be conflict. This is Umar ibn al-Khattab speaking. So I said, hold out your hand, O Abu Bakr. So he held out his hand and I swore allegiance to him and the Muhajirin swore allegiance to him. Then the Ansar swore allegiance to him. Thus we surrounded Sa'ad ibn Ubadah. One of them said, you have killed Sa'ad. I said, may Allah kill Sa'ad. Wallah, this is, you know, amazing shura. Amazing democracy, Islamic democracy. May Allah kill, I will kill, I will surround. Commotion, raised voices, thoughts. What, what the hell is this? Is this what we, is this the religion of Allah? Or is this the religion of Jahiliyyah? Then we, I go on, you know. Say, you know, this debate is on Abu Bakr. So the, natu the natural thing for my friend to do here is to find out how legitimate the mode used to elect him was. How many decision makers we are required to conduct what is termed shura and how to go on about electing a caliph. In Ahkam al-Sultaniyah of Mawardi, page six to seven, he stated, the Khilafah, can be organized in two ways. The first, the first way is through the band of Ahlul Hilli Wal Iqad, a band of decision makers. And the second way is by appointment from the outgoing Imam. As for the band of decision makers, the scholars have deferred on the number of how many should be present to have the Imam decided. So your scholars don't even know how many decision makers should be present in order to choose a caliph. A group of scholars has said, choosing a caliph should not take place except through the presence of decision makers from every town. So there can be general acceptability and submission to the chosen imam. And this madhab is contrary to the bayah of Abu Bakr for khilafah, which was based on which was based on only those who were present and those who were not in attendance were not waited for to pledge allegiance. So, you know, this is a contradiction in, the, in what your scholars view as a methodology in selecting a khalifa. Well, some are saying anybody that is present, decision makers, we don't know how many, how many of them, what's the number. Others said, oh, you know what, every village should bring its decision makers. And who are these decision makers? We don't know. Where in the Quran does it tell you about decision makers? Nowhere in the Quran. This is a tribal, this is tribal politics. Then another group said, this is still in Ahkam al-Sultaniyah I'm reading from. Another group said, the minimum of those to be present for electing a caliph must be five. They gather to elect the caliph. One of them calls for the gathering with the agreement of the four or that it must be held by six in attendance. So we have five, we have now six. And this is the view of most jurists and scholars from the people of Basra. And others said, Khilafah can be conducted through three people, led by one with the agreement of the other two. We have a third number. And another group said, it can be conducted with only one person because Al-Abbas said to Imam Ali to stretch his hand that he may give him bayah and people will say, the uncle of the prophet has given bayah. Then no two people will defer on you because it is a rule and the rule of one person is applicable. So, so my exhibit 12 is from Ahkam al-Sultaniyah of Mawardi, page six to seven. Um, so he went on to say here, he further explained, he said when the decision makers have selected someone and he has accepted, uh, he has accepted, the person has accepted and by I was given to him, this makes it compulsory for all others in the ummah to follow suit and offer him the pledge of allegiance. Basically what he's saying here is, you know, if the so-called decision makers, this tribal heads, if they have accepted, then you, you know, as an ordinary Muslim, you don't have a choice, you know, if you open your mouth, your head will be chopped off, basically. So on this confusion, ignorance and misguidance in Sunni Islam in regards to succession, the scholars even differed not only on the method and number required to choose a caliph, but also whether there was Nas from the Prophet. You like, you know, mentioning Nas, let me slap you with the Nas that your scholars are giving to us. Let me tell you about what your scholars say about Nas. Nas from the Prophet, you know, that there was not, was there Nas or was there no Nas? Your scholars differ on this. Those who said there was Nas, deferred whether it was even explicit Nas or indicative Nas. Now, on this basis, guess what? What Ibn Taymiyyah said, and this will make my Exhibit 13. Ibn Taymiyyah, in Minhaj sunnah Volume 1, page 486 to 487, he said, saying that Sunnis altogether don't believe the Prophet appointed anyone is not true. There are many groups from amongst the Ahlul Sunnah that believe the Imam of Abu Bakr can be evidenced through Nas. On this issue, there exists a difference of opinion. Imam Ahmad and other scholars, and in relation to this, Qadi Abu Ya'la has narrated two traditions from Imam Ahmad. The first one is that his Imama was established through election of people, and this view was adopted by a group from the Ahlul Hadith, the Mu'tazili, and the Asha'ira. And the same is the opinion of Qadi Abu Ya'la. The other is that it is true hidden Nas and indication. And this belief was adopted by Hassan al Basri, a group of Ahlul Hadith, Abu Bakr ibn Abdul Wahid, and the Bahisiya sect of the Khawarij. Sheikh Abu Abdullah ibn Hamid said that the proof that Abu Bakr was eligible to be the Khalifa, while the Ahlul Bayt and other Sahaba, oh, we are not from both Quran and Sunnah. So how many, how many minutes? I forgot to remind you, sorry. Okay, he stated that our ulama had this agreement whether leadership was proven from Nas or from Istidlal. This is Ibn Taymiyyah speaking, not me. A group among them, a group amongst us, believe that this is proven by Nas and the Prophet mentioned it uh, as Nas and specifically appointed Abu Bakr. Some scholars say it was true Istidlal. So it's not just, you know, the number of how many people will elect the Khalifa? No. Now you have a division, you know. Sunni scholars saying there was Nas for Abu Bakr. Others say, no, there was no Nas. Those who say there was Nas, they are divided. Was it an indicative Nas or was it an explicit Nas? So tell us, you know, was there Nas for Abu Bakr? Do you believe there was Nas? I need a clear answer. Apparently you don't because you think it's a political 
a political affair. Some of your scholars, some of your scholars, except if you are not a Sunni, then you have to declare, you have to be bold, you have to come out, tell us you're not Sunni. So we can know, we, you know, we are talking about, we are talking actually with somebody who is cherry picking, somebody who has a cocktail of beliefs. So don't tell us you're Sunni and you, oh, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu, you want to do taraddi on him. But guess what? You cannot defend him. This is not how a Sunni behaves. You have to defend your caliph. You have to show us in the Quran and in the Sunnah. To make things even messier, in the very lifetime of Abu Bakr, contemporaries of the companions themselves believed there was nas for Imam Ali and not for Abu Bakr. What's my proof for this? Hadith from Aisha in Bukhari 2741, narrated Al-Aswad. In the presence of Aisha, some people mentioned that the Prophet had appointed Ali by will as his successor. This is in Bukhari 2741, and this is my exhibit uh, 14. So what did Aisha say? She said, when did, they, when did he appoint him by will? She denied. So now you have some companions saying Imam, uh, Imam Ali was appointed by will. Aisha is denying. This is still within the context of Ahlul Sunnah. More confusion. Verily, when he died, he was rest Aisha is claiming that the Prophet was resting on her chest and he asked for a wash basin and then collapsed while in that state. And I could not even perceive that he had died. So when did he appoint him? Of course, in light of this, you know, in light of the hadith, there's a hadith in Bukhari. This is not an exhibit. I'm just speaking freely. 3104, you can cross check. Sahih Muslim. 2905D, the Prophet pointed towards the house of Aisha, saying the head of Kufr is from there, where the horn of Shaitan shall rise. This is how he was describing his wife. This is how he described her house. It is therefore obligatory not to take the word of Aisha as credible. You were mentioning, you know, the hadith. Now, guess what? Imam Ali, you know, some, you know, fake hadith, which I will come to. I will come to that, you know, that Imam Ali was actually given of Daliyah, a preference to Abu Bakr. You know, and Imam Ali can do jarh, jarh and ta'adil. This is the Prophet doing, doing jarh and ta'adil on Aisha. So you have to take the jarh and ta'adil of the Prophet. What did the Prophet say? He described her as the source of kufr and her house where the horn of shaitan shall rise. So at, at face value, I cannot accept the position of Aisha or her denial that there was no nas for Imam Ali. I will, ex I will instead accept the other, you know, nameless Sahabi who is mentioned in the, in the hadith. One minute. You know? One, One minute. minute. Okay, so best on another, on another note, you know, you know, let's, let's did actually the Prophet, did he actually die on the lap of Aisha or on her chest? In Al-Mustadbaq ala sahihain Al-Hakim narrates from Umm um Salama. By the one, she said, by the one, by whom alone do I swear. Ali was the closest to the messenger of Allah upon his death. We, she and Ali visited him in one afternoon. And then she went on to say, Ali came again. And I thought that he probably needed to have some privacy with the prophet. So we came out and sat at the door. I was closer to the door. The messenger bent his head over Ali and started talking to him confidentially, addressing him affectionately till he passed away. So Um Salama, this is my exhibit 15, Mustadlak Al Sahihain of Al Hakim, volume three, page 149. She is confirming that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he died, he died in the presence and on the chest of Imam Ali alayhi salam. Not what Aisha is claiming, not the evidence Aisha is claiming. This is what Um Salama alayhi wa is saying. And Dahabi concurs that this, this uh, narration is sahih. This is sahih. So I will end here. Then I, I will wait you know, for my next one to continue. Yeah, is it my turn now, Aziz? Yes, I'm ready. For... As soon yeah, as we start, I will start the time over there. Jazakallah. <clears throat> so, unlike my opponent here, uh, I'm going to try to actually address, inshallah, I will address every point that he made. I've been taking notes, and every point, inshallah, that I remember and that I took note on, I will be responding to, unlike my opponent. And I just want to give you guys a chance, inshallah, there's a Discord chat. I want you guys to enter a number between 0 and 4 of how many of the four arguments, out of the four arguments that I presented, how many did my opponent respond to? Yes, you are all witness that he responded to, he tried to respond to exactly... Uh, one, or sorry, two, two of those, and he, and he neglected the other two, and both of those two responses are weak, inshallah, that will be demonstrated beyond the shadow of a doubt right now. So we'll start with the easiest one to respond to. Again, he only tried to respond to two out of the four, Nahjul um, Balagha, and the argument from silence, um, and inshallah, we'll be re responding to both. But the easiest one to respond to, actually, is the argument from Nahjul Balagha. If you look at Super Omar's sources, uh, we have from uh, his own imam, uh, Muhammad Jawad Mughni, who says that uh, in his book, Fadal al-Imam, Ali, uh, page 72, and we have, again, because this was a condition that we agreed to, I posted the link to the PDF where you all can download the book and confirm what I'm saying. He who studies the life of the Imam and understands it and goes on to reading the book of Nahjul Balagha, he would have no doubt that the book is completely attributed from Imam Ali Salam from A to Z. Yes. So my opponent accused me of lying. I, I, I challenge him now to prove that I was lying because I've I substantiated my claim. Alhamdulillah. I challenge my opponent to do the same. Inshallah. This is the first thing. So we've this is the alhamdulillah we've dealt with his his weak rebuttal to my first argu uh, argument number three. It was I believe three or two. Uh, so now he has one argument that he tried to address and respond to how that's weak as well. He says, because my argument was as follows, yes, bring to me a set of instructions from the Quran and Sunnah regarding a methodology with which to uh, to uh, prove, uh, appoint the Imam, yes, or appoint the Khalifa. Your inability to do so, your inability to, to do that precludes your, your argument from being valid because you are making the case that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, I, I, I claim to be a follower of Sunnah, yes, I follow Quran and Sunnah and the example of the, 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 the first three generations. If you're claiming that there's inconsistency with my methodology, then your job is to show or demonstrate that inconsistency. You're saying, oh, I don't have to do, I don't have to do. Well, then if you don't have to do anything, then why are you here to debate? You are here making the positive claim. And if you're, in, you're not able to show an, a contradiction or an inconsistency within my framework, within my methodology of ascertaining what is Quran and Sunnah, what, is, what the Prophet preached, and what uh, in the Khilaf of Abu Bakr, then you fail to demonstrate your point. 
So it's, you're saying it's not your job, but, but it quite literally is your job when you come here to debate. That is that, your job is to demonstrate the contradiction. You saying you can't do it is not my problem. That, that's your problem. Yes. So Alhamdulillah, we, we've resolved. Uh, we've quickly dismissed your uh, pathetic attempts to respond to my uh, two out of my four arguments and the others. Alhamdulillah, the audience is witness that you said you were going to respond to Hadith al uh, and you failed to do so. You didn't even you, you, you acknowledge it and then you didn't respond. You said you're going to acknowledge it and then you didn't. And of course, um, there is the argument from your own scholar who says that in the absence of divine appointment, shura is acceptable. You did not respond to this, alhamdulillah. And we're all witness to that. Now we're going to go into the other things that you said. You said I had no arguments, alhamdulillah. I presented four coherent, cogent arguments for the entire audience. And inshallah, 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 inshallah bin hundreds of people will watch the replacement for them all to see. Inshallah. You keep going again and again, dying without knowing the imam of your time. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu alayhi salam is not the imam of our time. Yes, he died, he passed away. Yes, he was the imam of the time for the people who lived during his khilafah. So this, this hadith doesn't apply to me. Yes. Um, do I uh, believe that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is from the Khalafa al-Rashidin al Mahdiin? Yes, of course I do. Yes. This is the answer to your other question. Uh, this does not, you, you assert, you citing the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa referring to the Khalafa al-Rashidin, it does not preclude Abu Bakr. Like nothing in there precludes Abu Bakr. Not, the hadith doesn't say, uh, alaykum sunnati wa sunna al Khalafa al-Rashidin al Mahdiin min ba'di, uh, and Abu Bakr is not one of them. No, this nas does not, does not, go, does not even help you one atom in terms of you proving your argument, alhamdulillah. Um, again, then you say that, you, you, the next argument you presented was you, you cited a bunch of uh, evidences from various imma from Ahl sunnah um, say, saying that uh, you know there's a khilaf and, and, and some kind of confusion on, on, on the methodology with which the khalifa is to be appointed, and then you cite how oh some people agree that it's uh, even violence is allowed and uh, taking up the sword and this is all a, a method with which you can become the khalifa, and then you say that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu uh, did exactly that, and uh, and then you're trying to say the religion. Well, hang on, how does that follow? How does that follow? You're you're, you're showing a criteria from the Sunnah with which the uh, the khalifa is to be appointed. You prove how Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu agrees with that, okay? And then you assert this there's no contradiction. You are proving my point. Right. Well, again, I don't. I don't assert there is there is violence in either of those premises. But but your argument is non sequitur because there's no contradiction. You're helping me. You're saying, oh, violence is allowed. Abu Bakr did violence, therefore he's illegitimate. But how does that follow? That's not that's not an argument. Um, there's ikhtilaf on the nasab of Abu Bakr Yes, there's ikhtilaf on the nasab. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he said that there's ikhtilaf, and we know that there are uh, various opinions within Ahlul Sunnah. Your your argument that ikhtilaf constitutes the the fact that both of the issues uh, sides of the khilaf are invalid. It, this is nonsensical. And I'm so, if this is really your level of polemics and your level of argumentation, I apologize to the audience on my behalf for wasting your time for this debate. The existence of khilaf on an issue does not mean that both sides of the khilaf are invalid. This is, this is stupid. There's a khilaf on the issue of rafa'i yadin. Does that mean that both doing rafa'i yadin and not doing rafa'i yadin is, is, is or both sides are false? This is this is retarded to say. This is, this is really a, a two IQ point. May Allah preserve our brain cells. Um, you say, I'm not a Sunni because I say no nas. Again, this is just another demonstration of, of, of the, the level, the academic rigor of my opponent, right? You said, you proved using my books that there's ikhtilaf on whether or not Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu has nas, okay? There's ikhtilaf within my madhab on the issue, yes? Meaning that there is a certain subset of Ahl Sunnah, and in fact, they are the majority of Ahl Sunnah, who say that there is no nas. Then you proceed to claim that I'm not a Sunni because I say that there's no nas. How does that follow? How does that follow? When their majority of Ahl Sunnah says that there's no nas, and I, uh, and I uh, affirm the same, how does that show that I'm not a Sunni? What? Uh, regarding your reference from Bukhari 2741, I challenge my opponent because you, you made the statement that even the companions of the Prophet uh, believe that Imam Ali radiallahu anhu was appointed. Please show how these people who came to Aisha alayhi salam were companions. Please, this is this is your job because you are making the, 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 the claim. And then you went on a tangent because you realized, I think you realized that you're out of options now. You failed to prove the point. You became desperate and you changed the topic to Aisha radiallahu anha, which is not the topic of the debate. <laughs> you, dying on the lap of Aisha and you submit exhibit for this also. And what, what the hell does dying on the lap of Aisha radiallahu anha have to do with the legitimacy of khilaf, uh, legitimacy of the khilaf of Bakr radiallahu anha? This is completely absurd. And this, in fact, alhamdulillah, demonstrates the, the weakness of your argument and the desperation that you come to to, to have to resort to changing the topic. Uh, so yeah, alhamdulillah, uh, I await, uh, because I have now responded to, to four arguments, uh, sorry, I presented four arguments in my opening statement. Of those, you attempted to respond to two. Both of those, response, both of those responses, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, have been quickly dismissed. Um, and I await a, a counter response to those. Um, let's see. Okay, here we have we have another reference now alhamdulillah, from Mustadrak ala Sahihain, which I will be posting, inshallah, and consistent with the conditions that we agreed to before. The sources are translated and the PDF has been, will be provided in the Discord chat, as we agreed to before. Uh, we have Ali radiallahu anhu and Azubayr radiallahu anhu said, uh, nothing uh, upset us except the fact that we were late to the consultation. And we said that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is most worthy of its successorship after the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Very, he is the person of the cave, Ghar, and he is the second person with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the cave. We know his honor and his status, and the Prophet ﷺ appointed him to pray with the people during his lifetime. Al Hakim Ali Safuri says that this author, uh, report is authentic by the condition of Bukhari Muslim, and Al Dhahabi, he agrees with this. Alhamdulillah. So, again, this is further making the case for the legitimacy of the Khilaf of Abu Bakr. So, now Alhamdulillah, we have. Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. How many minutes? Five minutes. Right, just after okay. So, Alhamdulillah, I don't think I even need that much more time. Um, we, we, the, as the debate goes on, I'm giving more and more responses for my opponent to. Uh, to have to deal with. Before we had four that he, he needed to respond to. He attempted two out of the four. And, and again, those are failed attempts. 
So now we, we're left with five now. Five, five arguments that I challenge my opponent to respond to. Alhamdulillah, every evidence that you've presented in Rafid sources, which meet the conditions that we agreed to of the debate ahead of time, which was that yes, the debate, uh, the sources should be translated, in a link should be provided, or a link to the PDF from which the scan is derived should be provided so that somebody can authenticate during the debate. Alhamdulillah, every uh, source which you provided, which is consistent with those uh, conditions that we agreed to, I responded to. Um, I don't think I have anything else. Let me just check. Do you want to give me your remaining time as zakat? Uh, no, I will not be giving you my remaining time as zakat. Although you might need it, so uh, maybe I'll be generous. I have one more evidence to present, and then maybe I'll, I'll be, go ahead and be generous to you. So I'll give it to you, inshallah, no problem. Um, one more evidence, inshallah, and then I'll give you the rest of my time. Um, Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Hanbal uh, narrates, this is from Kitab al-Sunnah, hadith number 1292. And I want to make sure I have the PDF before I send this, because that was the condition that we agreed to. Uh, I'll look for the PDF in just a second. Um, but said, Abdullah ibn Ahmad ibn Muhammad uh, narrates that when the people gathered around Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, why do I not see Ali radiallahu anhu? So some men from the Ansar went and brought him. And he, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, said to him, oh Ali, you are the cousin of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa And you, uh, you, uh, circum uh, what? Uh, okay, Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, declared, do not blame, uh, both successor, uh, of the Messenger of God. Extend your hand. He, Ali radiallahu anhu, extended his hand and pledged allegiance to him. Then Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, why do I not see Azubair? Then men from the Ansar went and brought him. Then he Abu Bakr said, Oh, Azubair, you are the uncle of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the disciple of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Azubair declared, Do not blame, uh, O Caliph of uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Stretch out your hand. He has a very extended hand and pledged allegiance to him. This is again from Kitab al-Sunnah. And this is another uh, evidence, again, which meets the criteria that we agreed to, uh, which I await a response to, inshallah. I'm going to post a PDF now. And with that, um, I believe I've successfully proven, uh, presented the sixth argument, which I uh, await a response uh, from my opponent to. Uh, yeah, the sixth argument, which I'm awaiting a response to. I yield the rest of my time. Uh, can I go on? <clears throat> so now we're going to, I'm just going to make an announcement to Muhammad. Uh, we're going to change the format now. So everyone will have, every speaker will have 10 minutes as opposed to 15. Uh, Brother Muhammad will start. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, first of all, you know, he has not responded to anything I stated in terms of how do you choose a Khalifa? Nothing. Is it Nas? Is it not Nas? How many people? Tell us, how, for God's sake, don't you, don't you belong to a Sunni country? How do you choose a Khalifa? Was that how Abu Bakr was chosen? Is there a Quranic basis? He has not touched on anything. And you can see how he flipped from saying, you know what? Well, the Khilafah of Abu Bakr is a political office to saying, oh, well, you know what? Some Sunnis actually believe that guess what? Well, it was by Nas. In other words, it's from Allah. So, you know, this confusion that you're actually trying to, uh, you know, to patch, it's not moving well with you, super. You don't even know what to say. This is the problem. And, you know, see the last hadith, for example, you quoted from Kitab al-Sunnah. Let me just show you how, you know, how nonsensical this is. If you go to Kitab al-Sunnah, volume 2, 554, what did Abu Bakr say? He said, Mali la ara aliyan. Why do I not see Ali? He, in other words, Imam Ali was not present to give bay'ah. So guess what? The narrator goes on to tell us, Qal, rijalun min al -ansar, bih. Do you know what it means? Bih? When you use such a term in Arabic, it means he was dragged. This is what Kitab al-Sunnah is saying, ya, ya Ibn al-Halal. Imam Ali was dragged. This is what it means. And guess what? This, this, this Kitab al-Sunnah, if you check this narration, you know how funny it is. The statement, mashallah, the statement of Imam Ali coincides with the statement of Az-Zubair. The same wording, the same wording. And this hadith in particular, it contradicts the hadith in Bukhari that Imam Ali did not give bay'ah until after six months. And what does the hadith in Bukhari say? And also in Muslim, what does it say? It says Imam Ali alayhi salam did not pledge allegiance until after six months, after the death of Sayyida Fatima alayhi salam. And in, the, in, in, in Sahih Muslim 1759a, it says Imam Ali faced estrangement. In other words, he was actually castigated by society. He was more or less, you know, boycotted. This is, this is the oppression we are talking about. This is how your khilafah was built. What you, you cite in Imam Ali when your books are evidence against you, you know, but I'm not going to, you know, much be derailed by your, your red hearings. You know, you mentioned, for example, Najul Balagha, which, of course, I don't believe that scholar said that, but I will give you a quotation from Imam Khomeini. What did Imam Khomeini say about Najul Balagha? I have sent, I have sent uh, the link to the moderator of this statement by Ayatollah Khomeini. He said, he said that uh, in Kitab Najul Balagha, Haluhu Hal Baqiyat al Kutub, Fala Yumkin Ithbat Kulla Mafih, Bidar Sin Kati'in. That Nahjul Balagha is a book like all the other books. There is no possibility for us to make to actually establish that everything in it was actually said by the Masum. In other words, there was there's something weak in it and there's something that is not weak. And I already gave you the reference to a book by by uh, Abdul uh, Abdul Zahra Al Husseini Al Khatib. He wrote a book on the chains and the sources of the sermons in Nahjul Balagha. You ignored that as if I didn't answer. This is what you said. You ignored it. 
So I don't know, you know, how I am going to convince you when you pretend you didn't hear my response. Then I will, of course, you know, I will not pay much time into your red herrings. I will continue where I stopped. You know, I was mentioning Aisha to show you, her, her, you know, the way she responded to the claim that, oh, well, you know what, Imam Ali was actually uh, appointed by the Prophet. And you said, you know, how can we prove, you know, this person who made that claim was actually a Sahabi? Well, if he was not a Sahabi, he was a Tabi'i. In other words, he's one of the, you know, the three best generations in humanity. So he's still Hujjah upon you. You, you know, this is a conflict here. You Five know, the best, the best three, you say Five what? Yeah, as if, you know, as if this person who is talking to Aisha, he's not Hujjah upon you. And also, you know, let's even, you know, ignore what was said there. To make even the issue of the misguidance even, you know, more disturbing here. We go, you know, to Sahih Muslim 6830, Exhibit 16, Sahih Muslim 6830. This is actually the word of Umar ibn al-Khattab. He said, the pledge of allegiance to Abu Bakr, it was a mistake. And Allah saved us from its evils. According to Umar, Allah saved him. I don't know if Umar, because don't tell me, you know, Allah actually saved them from the evils. No, Allah did not save them from the evils. Because if Allah had saved them from the evils, we will not be here discussing this evil. We will not be here as Sunni and Shias. We will not be here, you know, massacring ourselves as Muslims. Allah did not save us from this evil. So this wahi that Umar is actually claiming that Allah saved him, He's, it's actually, he's bringing it from his stomach. Allah did not tell him he saved him. Because if Allah had saved him, we will not be here killing ourselves as Muslims. So this statement that Omar is actually making, it's baseless. It has no basis because he's not a prophet. He did not receive wahi from Allah. So he conceded. He said, Allah saved us from its evil, which is a lie, and that whoever shall repeat it, he should be killed. So why did you not start with yourself? Why did you not, why did you not apply the had on yourself for giving bay'ah to Abu Bakr without you know, the approval of the entire ummah? Then he went on to say, he confessed again. He said, Imam Ali and Al-Zubair opposed the caliphate of Abu Bakr. So how can the Pledge of Allegiance to the legitimate Caliph be called a mystic? How can legitimacy in the deen of Allah be a mystic? How is that legitimacy? And how can evils be legitimate? This is the question that Omar has to answer. And how did he know? I am talking about Omar here, Super Omar. How did Omar, your Caliph, know that Allah saved them while we are suffering the consequences till today? Going by what Omar said, Omar ibn Khattab, that anyone who repeats it, he, he should be killed. We read in Sunan al nasai 4059, Exhibit 17. The Messenger said, whoever changes, the religion, kill him. This is what, this is what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or who changes his religion, kill him. Umar is applying here changes to the religion of Allah. This is not the religion of Allah that was brought by Prophet Muhammad. So this is the reason I am asking you, prove the khilafah of your imams from the Quran. If Sunnis are confused or misguided on how exactly they should choose a caliph for the ummah, do you really have, you know, clear cut attributes? on you know who is actually fit to become caliph at least the bare minimum for him to become caliph the answer is yes you know your scholars have actually you know listed the qualities that somebody should possess in order for him to become a caliph so for example ibn hazm in al-fasl volume 4 page 128 exhibit number 18 he said he has to be a Qurayshi, he has to be up to the task he should be knowledgeable on the obligations of the deen he must be entirely pious does not cause facade on the earth he's not a servant to another man then taftazani sa'ad taftazani in sharh al-maqasid volume 5 page 223 exhibit number 19 among the qualities he listed he must be upright just mushtahid courageous up to the task and a Qurayshi. now you know if my time permits me i'm going to use this point to dissect the qualities of abu Bakr. was <laughs> abu Bakr fit was he fit to be the caliph i will use this quality stated by your scholars in order to scrutinize Abu Bakr, his personalities, his character, his actions, to determine if, if he was fit to be a Khalifa. Is my time up? You have 30 seconds. Oh, oh so, yeah. So I will use those qualities that Taftazani and Ibn Hazm have given. We are going to see, you know, if Abu Bakr was actually, you know, uh, possessing these qualities, he was actually fit to be a Khalifa. Or, you know, like Imam Ali said in one of the sermons in Nahjul Balagha, that, you know, Omar actually dressed Abu Bakr with, with the cloak of Khilafah so that, you know, his turn will be next. So I will end, I don't want to go into that point yet. When he finishes his, uh, sec his segment, then I will touch on that. We will examine, I'm going to scrutinize Abu Bakr bit by bit to see how qualified, or if he wasn't qualified to be the Khalifa, based on the conditions of your scholars. Okay, time. Uh, I'm ready, brother, super, when you're ready. Yes, before, before I start my rebuttal, before you start the timer, yeah. um, I do need to pray at some point in the next uh, 20, 25 minutes. Can we have a five-minute break for Salah? Or, um, absolutely, what's... absolutely, inshallah. Okay, okay, inshallah. So, I mean, I... You I have, to... but you, uh, do you have 10 minutes to do, yeah, finish finish this segment? Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I can finish this segment, even the next segment, for both parts, if he wants, whatever he wants. But I do need to pray at some point in the next 25 minutes, inshallah. So, um... Inshallah, after this uh, segment you finish, then we'll be even. We'll, we can take a break, uh, let's say 20 minutes for everybody. Okay, I just need, I just need no, 20, 20 minutes is too much. If he wants to take five minutes to pray, I think it's okay. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, inshallah. Inshallah. Okay, Once you start, I'm, uh, I'll start your timer. I'm ready to start. Okay, so the question uh, again, I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. I'm trying to, unlike my opponent, I'm trying to respond to every point that he makes instead of avoiding the topic. Like he avoided uh, the arguments that I brought, two of them he tried to uh, give responses to, and the rest he just completely uh, did the harifah, he just completely ignored. <clears throat> so we're going to go over everything. So the first thing he started with was 
um, how do you elect a caliph? Yes. As I said that in my opening statement, that the Quran and Sunnah Sharia outlines a broad set of constraints with which we can appoint a caliph. Okay. Anything within that uh, that fits within those constraints is considered a valid methodology. So we can do shura, for example. We can have the previous uh, caliph appoint the next caliph. These are, these are both uh, valid examples. Yes, and, there, and there's other, and, and the ulama, my opponent actually did the job of showing that, that, my, uh, that the ulama of Ahlul Sunnah have given a number of different methodologies with which, and none of these contradict the Quran and Sunnah, unless my opponent can pr prove otherwise. Yes, uh, the same way that, uh, you know, it's, it's like asking the question of, oh, how do you go to the masjid? Well, anything that's within the parameters of, of what's allowed in Quran and Sunnah, you can drive, you can go walking, you can go on a camel, uh, uh, but you can't, you know, for example, go on a stolen car. This would be, you know, haram, for example. So anything that is uh, in agreement with a broad set of constraints within Quran and Sunnah is, is a valid methodology. So I don't want anyone to say that I'm avoiding the question. I answered the question. How do you appoint a, a caliph? I said, Shura is a valid methodology. Yes, uh, uh, a caliph appointing successor is also a valid method. Yes, this is this is an agreement with Quran and Sunnah. My opponent said I flipped. I, I'm, I'm, I'm curious as to what, what position have I flipped on throughout this debate. I, I've been very consistent, alhamdulillah. No, I never asserted that there, that there was any else for Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. That is not my position. That is the position that you are referencing from other ulama from Ahl Sunnah. And the majority say that there was not Nasana, and this is the position that I take, alhamdulillah. Um, with regards to, you said that uh, Waja'abi, this refers to uh, Ali radiallahu anhu being dragged. Uh, that's, that's not accurate. Ja'a means brought. So the person was, was brought to, uh, Ali radiallahu anhu was brought. Dragged is your own, you know, you're trying to dramatize it and add details like you guys normally do, you know, with the issue of Karbala and all. Again, not to get off topic, but the way that you guys over dramatize and oh, a thousand arrows here. This is, this is your dramatization. No. There was, he was brought to Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And it could be as simple as sending a messenger. Ya Ali, uh, Abu Bakr is calling you. Oh, this, this constitutes Ja'abi. So this is, this is not. Uh, uh, Constitute uh, being dragged. Well, I, um, <laughs> I think it's kind of funny, and I, I want everyone to be witness to this. SubhanAllah, you, you, you cited the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu saying about the person who changes his religion. <laughs> this is referring to apostasy. Uh, the hadith of apostasy, and you're saying that, oh, Umar or Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu changed their religion. That's, that's different from creating a bid'ah. Let me help you out. There's a better hadith you can use for that. Man astaqal hadith kitab Allah, wa khayrul hadith hadith Muhammad, wa sharul umuri muhtasatuhah, wa kullu muhtasatin bid'ah, wa kullu bid'ah, wa kullu bid'ah, wa kullu Yes, yes, we all know this hadith mutawatir, that anybody who innovates in the religion is, is you know, or, or the innovations in the religion are in hellfire, yes? So this is the, <laughs> let me help you out here. You cited the wrong hadith. Changing religion, this refers to uh, apostasy. Um, you said that I lied upon, the, regarding the authenticity of um, Nahj al-Falaqa, you said that I lied upon your ulama. Do you, do you retract this? Because I provided the proof. I provided the proof. And then you, and then you, and then you, instead of responding to that, you said, "Oh no, well, other scholars denied." Well, yes, so I know that other your ulama cope, and that you know your books are inconsistent, and some of them they try to weaken these books. But is, did I lie when I said that uh, Muhammad Jawad Mukhniya he authenticates it? I provided. Yeah, it's a, it's a lie. lie. If if you want us to take a break, it's we can my, take my, a break. Let's verify. It's my time to speak. No, if you if you insist, we can cut the uh, the clock and let's verify the link. Yeah, uh, that's I think that's possible. I mean, if because brother uh, Super Umar, uh, brother Rafid, he obviously doesn't accept that. So, um, if you cut the link, it would be great. Let's do it, inshallah. Let's do it. Pause the time, please. Okay, uh, brother, these yeah. can you pull the. Pause the time. Pause the time. Can you can you send at, me I through the back? Yeah, pause the time please. at four thirty-four. So four minutes thirty-four seconds. Yeah. So Super Ahmad, send me the exact the volume, the name of the book, the name of the scholar, the volume, and the page number. Send it yes. through the back channel. Let us check it. No, I, I sent it in the evidence that the the place where we agreed all the. No, no, no. I want to verify on my own. I want to get the book, even if it's going to take an hour. So give me the name of the scholar, the name of the book, the volume, and the page number, and let us verify this claim. Also, can you mention it because you send like all the links at once, so it's difficult to like which one are you mentioning? Yeah, no problem. Uh, okay, so I sent the link, alhamdulillah, uh, in uh, Safdar is the proxy for sending from Discord to not Discord. Uh, then please forward this to. Uh, to... Don't send it to me, not pin it up then here, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here, um, I'm going to. This is uh, Fadail uh, Al Imam Ali uh, by Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, page seventy-two. And yeah, this is this is this is not right to, to cut me off in my time. But uh, again, we're trying to be generous here because even if we are as generous as possible, you will never never prove your religion. This is our position. Alhamdulillah. So we'll, we'll be generous with you, Inshallah. Technically, according to the rules of a debate, this would be considered forfeit, as if you just interrupt your opponent during his time. But anyways. No, no, bro. It was agreed before the debate. But if there's any references, uh, oh, which, if if someone doubts them. So he so, should have, he should have, yeah, well, so no, no, actually, well, we agreed to that, but then we did a tahrif of that, we, we revised it. We had a badat, we said that, no, we're going to have Brother Seeking Alam, his 24-7 job. Uh, do, Super Omar, do, you have the, do you have the PDF as well, the link to this? Because it, yeah, yeah. So the website that I sent, the website that I sent, it has a, a, a download option for the PDF. Alfakir.net, this is a, an online library, okay, which has PDFs for everything. But Rafid, have you got this now? Are you checking it? Just let us know when you're ready to start the clock. Uh, say that I sent it to you. Oh, no worries, I'll pin it up here as well if anyone is interested.
So actually, while you guys verify this, I think that would be a good time for me to take my Salah break. Uh, the clock has been top, stopped at 4.34, yes? That's correct. Inshallah, when I come back, I will have 5 minutes and 26 seconds. Inshallah. Taqabbal Allah, man. So I'll pin the link up for anyone who's interested in looking at the, the book that uh, Super Omar mentioned. Uh, Sayed, should I send you the link to page 72? I got the link yeah, of the book. Yeah. So I will send you through the back channel on, on Clubhouse. Um, you have my number, just WhatsApp me if you have my number. I've sent you the link, uh, Sayed, just uh, check it out. Okay, I'll go, I'll go here. I'm going to pin it up. So is this from the same book? Yeah, so this is the book he, he cited, Fada'il uh, al-Imam Ali, al-Shaykh. Muhammad Jawad Mughniyeh. He said he's my imam. That's why he said he's a sheikh. He's not an imam. Al Juz Al Awwal, Volume 1, page 72. Anyway, we'll, when he comes, when he's done with Salah, we will read, inshallah, what the sheikh said. Sayed, did you get the link? Oh yeah, you want the link? You want me to send it so you can share in Discord as well? Yeah, 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 share it. But by the way, it's like, Brother Super Omar is like, praying Taravi or what? So, sorry, I mean the prayers. No, he said he wanted five minutes pray, so inshallah, whenever he's back, we'll continue. So. Okay, okay.
Okay, I'm back. Hello. <coughs> Thank you, Minama. Okay, so I provided the link that I spent here. This is the book. If you read everything till the last paragraph, he said, Wait, 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 this is my turn. So what happened after no, your turn? No, the time, the clock had stopped. No, 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 no. Uh, if you want to, one second, if you want to respond to the argument, you can do that in your time. If you're accusing me okay, of no, lying. Right. Go ahead, go ahead, yeah, that's fine. But, but I, just want to, I just want to clear up because you, because this was the initial accusation. We had yeah, yeah. a positive I, I was going to clarify this, brother, uh, brother Omar. I was going to clarify this. Jazakallah khair. Uh, you, let me know when you want to start. I'll, I'll continue your timer. You have, you have no, already. I, I used... want this point to be clear. So, if you want to go ahead as a moderator to go ahead and uh, make the point that I was making, inshallah, that would be great. And then I'll and I'll continue my my time after that. No, no, super, but it's your turn. No, no, no it's, it's your turn. You finish, and then inshallah, then after Mubarak, it's not fair for you. You have to go. Yeah, but, no, but because this because this incident of stopping the the person's time, interrupting and stopping yeah. time. Uh, that, that brothers, uh, I've tried to keep the time as accurate as possible, but uh, yeah, and you're, please refrain from like interrupting, uh, brother Omar, when it's his time, uh, whatever the is issue it? is. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've had yeah, I've had almost ten formal debates. This is the first time that I've ever been interrupted in a formal debate. But anyways, that's okay. Um, we'll we'll continue inshallah. I'm I'm so, ready to continue. So we'll be continuing uh, the remainder of uh, brother Super has the remaining of his ten minutes. He's already used up four minutes thirty four seconds seven point seventy five whatever. Uh, as soon as he starts speaking, I will start the timer. Yes. Um. So yeah. So again, my my opponent uh, he he accused me of lying on Muhammad Jawad uh, Again, I, and I never said that. Uh, or I never claimed that this was his infallible imam, meaning son of Ar-Ridha. Uh, what I said was that this is your scholar. So I asked him, are you going to throw your ulama under the bus? I said it very clear. The first time I made the argument, and I said it very clear, um, very clearly that this is from, from the ulama of Arakaba. This is, this is, there was, if you want to throw him out under the bus, that's, that, that's on you. I want, but I want you to say it. I want you to say it on recording. That I hereby throw Muhammad Jawad Muhniya, my scholar, my ala, I'm throwing him under the bus, and he's wrong. Uh, and again, you, you accuse me of lying. You accuse me of lying. So you should also say on the, on, on the record that I retract my, my, my accusation of lying upon Super Omar. Because you said that I, the, your ulama didn't say this. Uh, you know, so, so you should retract the statement as well. Um, regarding the people that came to Aisha, radiallahu anha, again, you made the, you made the, uh, the claim that the Sahaba had this opinion. But now you're doing a bada. Now, again, why are you changing your mind? Your argument was that the Sahaba had this view. And now you're saying it was the, the view of potentially Tabi'in or, or whatever. This is, uh, there's a big difference, right? Because you, you made the claim of Sahaba. You should back it up. Or you admit openly that, yes, you, you lied upon uh, the Sahaba and this was not their uh, position. Um, again, playing with words, Ja'abi does not mean, I dare you, please. I dare you to prove the Ja'abi refers to uh, Ja'abi refers to someone being dragged. This is just your over-dramatization, as the Zarafat always do, of, um, of events. Um, again, another mistranslation. You said that Umar radiallahu anhu said that this was a mistake. That's not what Falta means. The word he used was Falta, meaning something that was done hastily, fast, without proper consideration. And yes, to educated people in the audience, they know what happened at the issue of Saqif and why it was urgent, why it was done um, with something that was hasty. It wasn't done with you know, uh, enough time, and that's why Imam Ali wasn't able to be con uh, uh, consulted. That's what he was referring to. So he's actually agreeing that yes, of course, it was done hastily. If we had more time, then we for sure would have consulted Ali radiallahu anhu and the other Sahaba. But because of because it was a falta, because it was a, an urgent situation, that's why it was done. He didn't say mistake. He said falta. There's no there's no wrongdoing. In fact, he's the one who did it himself. So why he's going to say he made a mistake? Uh, again, uh, playing with the hadith, playing with the hadith. I want people to be witness to this. You cited a hadith on apostasy for the for for what? For the wrong uh, for the wrong <clears throat> point that you're trying to make. This is a hadith of prophecy. So you can do have a bada now in front of everyone. Again, there's another thing I want you to retract publicly. The fifth or sixth thing that you should retract in, in the middle of the debate. That you said wrong, inshallah. And again, I want you to respond to this point because you, you have not responded to this at all throughout the entire debate. Many arguments, but this one specifically, I want you to respond to. You've really been avoiding this. Al Muntadari says, Ali radiallahu anhu said, and the mandatory matter in the judgment of Allah and the judgment of Islam over the Muslims after their Imam dies or is killed, it is not from them to make an event nor innovate an innovation nor spread false beliefs. Rather, please pay attention to this part and please address it. Don't just ignore it. Rather, they are to pick for themselves a pious Imam, knowledgeable and pious, aware of the judiciary and the Sunnah, unites their affairs. And Muntazari states, as it appears from the hadith that it is obligatory for the people to choose and that he is the originator of the Atar, but he is in rank that is behind the choice of Allah. If he, the Imam, is not appointed as in the time of Qayba, for example, then the choice of the people is the one by which the leadership is established to refer to the entire hadith. This is uh, in Dirasat fi Wulaid al Faqih, volume 1, page 508. Please stop avoiding this argument that I'm bringing again and again. It's been, I don't know how many hours into the debate you've addressed this argument exactly zero times. Please. Just because you ignore it doesn't mean it's going to go away. <coughs> one minute remaining. Yeah. One minute remaining. Um, and yeah, and again with hadith of Daliya and, and 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 the other points, uh, you know, your misspeaks. Please, I'm, I'm I'm keeping track of all these things that are being recorded, and I'm writing them down. All the things that you need to rectify, all the lies that you've made, all the misrepresentations, Jaabi, and uh, the lie about the companions, and the lie about me lying on uh, Muhammad Jawad Muhniya. All these things, I'm I'm writing them down. I'm waiting for you to respond, inshallah. Because after the debate, the, your the Rafid Bashir leaders are going to come. Oh, Subhanallah, got destroyed. Subhanallah, I got destroyed. Your guy is lying and, and, and openly lying, recorded. Okay, not addressing my arguments continuously again and again and again. Subhanallah, on what basis are you saying that Subhanallah got destroyed? On what basis? This is, this is clear as day. Please, if you can respond to this argument, inshallah, maybe you can have some, some, some face to show after the debate. 
Al Montadori says, and I, and I read, I don't have enough time to read it again. Please respond to it. Just because you don't respond to it doesn't mean I'm, I'm, it's going to go away or I'm going to forget about it or the audience is going to forget about it. This evidence has been presented according to the conditions that we agreed to. Please respond. I yield the rest of my time. Uh, may I go on? Uh, so uh, we'll be starting another 10 minute uh, session for each. Brother Muhammad, as soon as you start speaking, I will start the time. Okay, so apparently our friend here, you know, he's dodging. You know what's the meaning of dodging? He's trying to dodge. He's asking me about Wilayat al Faqih. Is this debate about establishing the legitimacy of Wilayat al Faqih? What does Wilayat al Faqih mean? Does it mean election of a riffraff into the office of the Wali al Faqih? This is not the meaning of Wilayat al Faqih. If we are going to go into the meaning of Wilayat al Faqih and its legitimacy, it has to be a debate or a discussion on its own. Wilayat al Faqih is not about uh, Saqifa, it is not even about Shura. It is about the alim who has the fulfilled conditions being there has naibul imam. In other words, in the physical absence of absence of the imam, and this does not did not only take place in Ghaibat al-Kubra. We have many examples, even in the lifetime of the other imams. Like for example, Imam Ali alayhi salam appointed Malik al-Ashtar as the governor of Egypt because he wasn't physically present in Egypt. This is a discussion on its own. So I don't know why I have to tell you about Wilayat al-Faqih when all it needs is for you to prove to me that your caliphate or your khalifa, he has bases in the Quran. You even said, you say, oh, I have mentioned your scholars mentioning methodologies or talking about method methodologies. Well, I have helped you out. So now what you need to do is for you to go to the Quran and say, oh, you know, that scholar that says it needs three people from the Ahlul Hilli wal Iqad, you know, to elect a Khalifa. This scholar, his verse is in this surah or in this hadith or this person that says it is six people. It is from this. Or, you know, the previous caliph can appoint the succeeding caliph. It is from this verse. Do it, ya Habibi. What are you waiting for? Why do you need me to help you to tell you what your scholars are saying? Go ahead and do it. Where in the Quran does it say, for example, we can use Shura in order to do what? To elect the Khalifa. And not only that, not only that, you know, you question my claim when I said, you know, there is a blood, there's a history of bloodshed in your, in your system of caliphates. Go to Sahih Muslim, 1853. It has been narrated on the authority of Abba Sa'id al-Khudri that the messenger said, when oath of allegiance has been taken for two caliphs, kill the one for whom the oath was taken later. So if you have two leaders, you kill one of them. He's a, he's a lamb, you know, sacrificial lamb. Then, you know, talking about the Ahlul Hilli wal Iqad, in Sunan Nasai 808, narrated from Qais ibn Ubaid, while I was in the masjid in the first row, a man pulled me from the back and moved me aside and took my place by Allah. I could not focus on my prayer. When then when he left, I saw it was Ubay ibn Kaab. He said, Oh boy, may Allah protect you from harm. This is this this is what the Prophet instructed us to do, to stand directly behind him. Then he obeyed, turned to the face to face the Qibla and said, Doomed at the Ahlul Uqud by the Lord of the Kaaba. So these people who are your decision makers are being cost here. You know, I don't want to waste, you know, even when your claim about, about uh, Sheikh Mughni, first you said your imam, you said he's my imam. Now you want me to retract. Retract what? Did you even read what the guy said? He's a sheikh, that's number one, he's not my imam. And you know, you're talking about Bada, you, you don't even understand what you're talking about. You don't understand the claim that this man is talking about. What did he mention here? He mentioned that there are people who claim that Nahjul Balagha, either all of it or part of it, is, it is matsus. In other words, it is fabricated or manhul or altered. In, then he went on to say, Inna fihi wa istilahat, wa there are, that there are actually meanings and terminologies of falsafa, of philosophy, of kalam. So he's saying, you know, this book contains, you know, glitters of the statements of the imams, but there are people who claim that either part of it or all of it. Now, if he wants to take it, if he, however you want to analyze, you know, this is not our topic again. It's a read here in time wasting tactic. If you want to, you know, interpret his statement, whatever he's saying, go ahead. But even the Sheikh is mentioning that there are people who claim that either part of it or all of it is actually fabricated. And then he's saying, oh, well, no matter what, they are actually, you know, still a hard terminologies, uh, glitters of the wordings of the Imams. And we don't deny, I don't deny that. But to say all of it is actually Sahih, no, this is not true. So, you know, I will go back to where I left, even though you've wasted half of my time on this round. I will go back to where I was actually uh, reading earlier on. In my last round, you know, I was trying to, you know, examine, to scrutinize Abu Bakr, you know, based on the qualities that Taftazani and Ibn uh, Hazm uh, have given us, you know. So let's look at Abu Bakr. You know, the issue of knowledge, for example, was Abu Bakr actually a mujtahid? You know, you're talking of wilayat al-faqih. Wilayat al-faqih means the rule of the jurist. Abu Bakr, was he a jurist? Was he fit like the, like, like the, wilay, the, like the wali al-faqih we have in Iran? Is he a qualified mujtahid? Did he have knowledge to rule based on the laws and the obligations of the deen of Allah, based on the con as a condition given by Ibn Hazm? Let's see what Ibn Qayyim mentioned in A'lam al muwakkain an Rabbil Alameen. He said, it is mentioned here in this book, Abu Bakr had no knowledge about inheritance of a grandmother until Muhammad ibn Salama and Mughira ibn Shu'bah told him, this is your Khalifa. You know, he's supposed to be guiding people. Now people are guiding him. Subhanallah. Like if you go to Surah Yunus, I think verse 35 or 34, it says, you know, Allah sets a, sets a principle. Is the one, you know, who guides more worthy to be followed than the one who needs himself to be guided. Your Khalifa, he's been guided. And this is Exhibit 20 from Alam al-Muqqa'in an Rabbil Alamin, Volume 2, page 192. He didn't know. 
He didn't know about the laws of inheritance. And this is the same man who narrated a single, a single isolate, isolated report from the Prophet that no one other Sahabi or member of the Ahlul Bayt have, have had, claiming Prophets do not leave inheritance to deny the daughter of the Prophet her rightful inheritance. And in contravention, not even inheritance, her gifts from the Prophet, and in contravention of the Quran that Prophets don't leave inheritance. This man doesn't even know that a grandmother, how a grandmother should in, in, inherit. He didn't know about it. Then we go to Sahih Bukhari, 7198. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, Allah never sends a Prophet or gives the Khilafah to a caliph, but he, the prophet or the caliph, has two groups of advisors. A group advising him to do good and exhort him to do it, and the other group advising him to do evil and exhort him to do it. But the protected one, the ma'asum, is the one Allah has protected. Man asim Allah, Exhibit 21, Sahih Bukhari 71-98. Based on this hadith, the opponent here, Umar, cannot prove that Allah made Abu Bakr a caliph. He cannot prove that Allah protected him from error or sin. He cannot prove that Abu Bakr was ma'asum. Sunnis generally do not believe the caliphs were ma'asumin, or they were infallibles. The word used in this hadith is ma'asum. So I want Umar, my opponent here, to declare if he believes Abu Bakr was a ma'asum based on Bukhari 71-98. Going by the bare minimum qualities that Sunni scholars have listed, a caliph must possess courage. Let's see if Abu Bakr was courageous. Sahih Bukhari 39-22, Abu Bakr was not courageous based on this hadith. Guess why? The Prophet had to tell him to be silent. Iskut, be silent, Abu Bakr. This hadith is a clear distinction between the courage of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and that of Abu Bakr, the coward. Was he worthy of sitting on the seat of the Prophet? Narrated himself, Abu Bakr implicating himself here. This is Exhibit 22, to nail Abu Bakr, to show him as a coward. Bukhari 39, 22. He said, I was with the Prophet in the cave. When I raised my head, I saw the feet of the people. I said to oh, Allah's Messenger, if some of them should look down, they will see us. You know, they will see him. They are going to eat him. He was scared. The Prophet said, oh, Abu Bakr, be quiet. For we are two and Allah is the third of us. He, does, he has even forgotten the Quran. That if you're two, Allah is the third. If you're, three, if you're three people, Allah is the fourth. He has forgotten who was even sitting beside him. That Rasulullah, the messenger of Allah that Allah protects, is sitting beside him and he should not be a coward and be shaken like a kid. And this is, this is the person you want to make a Khalifa. The question for my opponent is, how can I have such a leader who will start shaking and spreading panic in the face of the enemy instead of displaying valor and courage and protecting me? Five so how remaining. can I actually make this guy a Caliph? Sorry, do I have five any minutes, minutes more? Remaining. Okay, so in Kanzal Ummal, this is Exhibit 23, Kanzal Ummal, Volume 13, page 121, narrated Abdul Rahman ibn Abi Layla. I said to Ali, you used to wear a cloak and thick clothes in the extreme hot days and wearing two thin clothes in the extreme cold days. It goes on, you know, Imam Ali says, were you not with us in the day of Khaybar? I said, yes, by Allah, I was with you. He said, the messenger of Allah sent Abu Bakr with people. They ran away and returned to him, to the messenger of Allah. Then, sorry, they ran, they ran away. Then the messenger of Allah sent to Umar, he also ran away. So the first, the second, they are running away. This is during the Battle of Khaybar. This exact account, the similar matin, is actually found in Al-Mustadrak al sahihain Exhibit 24, Mustadrak, Volume 3, page 39. And guess what? The grading of this is Sahih. You know, so in case you want to reject Kanzul Ummal, face the one in Mustadrak, Volume 3, page 39, uh, so that you will not complain about the issue of the grading. Then we go, you know, we have given you example of, you know, somebody who is not courageous in the cave, somebody who is not courageous in the Battle of Khaybar, now I will give you about the Battle of Uhud, Ibn Kathir, Exhibit 25, Bidaya wa Nihaya, Volume 5, page 396, narrated Aisha. When Abu Bakr remembered the day of Uhud, he wept. She went on to say that Abu Bakr stated he was the first to flee from the Battle of Uhud. So can this guy protect me if I want to make him my leader? So then let's, let's move on, you know, to the other qualities. Was he pious? If so, why were they condemned, for example, in the Quran for raising their voice over the voice of the Prophet? Uh, based on Hadith 43, 67 in Bukhari, it shows, you know, in the very lifetime, in the life of the Prophet, Umar and Abu Bakr, they were engaged in power tussle over leadership and trying to influence the state of affairs. This is Exhibit 26, Sahih Bukhari 4367. Abdullah bin Zubair said that a group of riders belonging to Banu Tamim came to the Prophet. Abu Bakr said, appoint Al-Qa'qa bin Ma'bad bin Zurara as ruler. Umar said, no, appoint Al-Aqra bin Habis. Thereupon, Abu Bakr said to Umar, you just want to oppose me. Umar replied, I did not want to oppose you. So both of them argued so much that their voices became loud. And then the following divine verse, verses were revealed in that connection. O oh, you who, who believe, do not be forward in the presence of Allah and his apostle, you know, till the end of the verse. Ibn Hazm said, Exhibit number 27 in Al-Muhalla, Volume 11, page 412, raising one's voice in front of the Prophet, as by the statement of Allah, reveals that one's deeds are written off and it is part of kufr. In his tafsir, the Maliki scholar, Ibn Abi Zamnin, of the fourth century, this is exhibit number 28, Tafsir Ibn Abi Zamnin, volume four, page 260. He said, he said that, uh, he described those who raise their voices above the voice of the prophet as hypocrites. He stated, some people from among the hypocrites used to come to the messenger and they used to raise their voices above his voice. Now, whether he's describing Abu Bakr or describing somebody else is not the issue. The issue here, he's describing those who raise their voices as hypocrites. It's the action of the hypocrites or the quality of a hypocrite. Either way, he went on to say, they intended through that, hurting and belittling yeah, the prophet. One minute so, they, so they have been attributed with what they display of Iman in the apparent. Then, 
I, I will further, you know, I will further underscore how the Prophet himself viewed the state of religion of Abu Bakr and how the Prophet refused to testify for Abu Bakr's Iman. We read in the Muwatta of Malik, Book of Jihad, Hadith number 21, Yahya related to me from Malik, from Abu, 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 Abu Nadir, the Mawla of Umar ibn Ubaidullah, that he had the Messenger of Allah. Uh, said over the matters of Uhud, I testify for them. Abu Bakr said, Messenger of Allah, are we not their brothers? We entered Islam as they entered, and we did jihad as we did. The Messenger, what did he reply? He said, yes, but I don't know what you will do after me. A slap in the face. Exhibit 29, Mawatta of Malik, Book of Jihad, uh, Hadith number 21. Brother Muhammad, your time is up right now. 15 minutes completed. Leave that point to your next 15-minute uh, section, inshallah. Uh, Brother Super, as soon as you start, start speaking, you, I'll start your timer for your 15 minutes. Uh, all right, just, but, um, just real quick before I start my time, how many more uh, sections are... Of the debate are left. So there, uh, this is now uh, we're enter we're doing the fifth fifth section uh, fifth stage. Uh -huh. No, no, we just came out from break. So <clears throat> we're doing the fourth stage. There's going to be a fifth a fifth stage, which is also 15 minutes sections each, and then the last section, which is the conclusion part, 15 minutes each, 15 each as well. Minutes. So we have an hour left, like this time 10 minutes and then an hour after that. No, no, 15 minutes right now. One okay. more 15 minutes, and then the last 15 minutes as a conclusion. Okay. Okay. Great. And Wait, then after uh... that. Maybe I've stopped it. I haven't started your timer. Uh, after that, are you guys going to be opening the 20 minute Q&A for the audience to send no, no, questions really to, to the admins? I, really to to that. I can do a Q&A later. Yes, I really have to go after this. Um, and just one last thing to the moderators. I'll say like uh, excessive insulting of the Sahaba. I would uh, ask that if, if either one of us insults the other's figures unnecessarily, you know, calling them coward or calling them like a little kid, that you reprimand them for that. But uh, that's at your discretion. Um, I'm ready to start. Well, you were, you were mentioning Karbala. You were mentioning Bada. You were making stupid jokes. You're forgotten? Yeah, but I didn't insult your figures. I, it's not an insult. It's what the hadith says. I'm not. I'm only describing. I'm not insulting anybody. You you use the hadith says coward and little boy. Well, when somebody is shaken and he's scared from the enemy and he's supposed to be the leader protecting me. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, okay. So no let's problem, keep academic. No Any of these side comments? If someone either either one of you, I'll, I'll pull you up on it. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, brother Bayan. That's why I should ask you for you to be one of the moderators. Um. Okay. Uh, anyway, so I'll start my time now, inshallah. Sure. Okay, so the my opponent is claiming uh, with regards to the the uh, evidence that he, he has a hard time responding to. Um, he says that this is referring to wilayat al faqih Yes. Um, and Ali. So so then this means that Ali radiallahu anhu is speaking about wilayat al faqih Is that is that what uh, like Ali radiallahu anhu is telling us about Khomeini, Khomeini and Hamanai and all these people? Because the hadith says Ali radiallahu anhu says, and the mandatory matter in the judgment of Allah and the judgment of Islam over the Muslims after their Imam dies. No mention of wilayat al faqih in this hadith over the Muslims after their Imam dies or is killed. It is not from them to make an event nor innovate an innovation nor spread false beliefs. Rather, they are to pick for themselves. Rather, they are to pick for themselves. Rather, they are to pick for themselves a pious Imam, knowledgeable and pious, aware of the judiciary and the Sunnah, unites their affairs. Yes, I've repeated it three times. So I want to know where in this, you know, where 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 is the evidence that Ali radiallahu anhu is referring to Wilayat al-Faqih and Khamenei and Iran and all these things. This is my opponent's that will please show me where is the, how, how are you connecting into this? Um, so this is the first thing, the, the scan that my opponent, or the hadith that my opponent keeps avoiding. He just says, as if, as if that gets away. Hadith uh, radiallahu anhu is not referring to Wilayat al-Faqih, or at least your, your conception. What's the source you're reading from? Again, you cannot interrupt me during my time. This is a formal debate. Yeah, um, sorry, bro, have you got the source for that? Because yeah, why, the, the problem is Muhammad, yeah. uh, Muhammad Rafid, he can't see the sources you're citing unless he asks you that. I'm, I'm, I'm stopping the timer, by the way. Yeah, stop the time, please, the timer. Aziz. Stop the time. But Rafid, are, you referring to, okay, so, sorry, are you referring to letter number six here, or are you talking about a different source? Yeah. Okay. So, if you're just so, first of all, um, everything that I'm referencing from the law is posted in the where we agreed that everything would be posted. Uh, I, I don't know. You guys have some internal proxy going on between Discord and Clubhouse. You guys need to sort that out. Everything that I posted according to the terms that we've agreed to. Bro. Yeah, bro. Bro, but it's not the line. You post all the things at once. That's the issue, bro. You need to no, tell us like again. which. I posted, it, I posted it again. I posted it again. It's the second time. The last two things that I posted are exactly the thing that I'm referencing. An Arabic scan. And... Just give, give us the name of the book, uh, Omar. Give us the name of the book. The Volume One. You say what? Al-Faqih. Al no, 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 the first uh, word. I didn't hear the first word. Uh, Dirasat. Dirasat. Hold on one second. Say Okay, wait. Sardar, can you send me the link right now, please? And I can pin it up. Who wrote that book, oh, uh, Omar? It's done. Say it. Check it. Author of the book Al Muntadari. Al who? Muntadari. Sorry, can you, can you raise your voice? Ayatullah Muntadari. Muntadari, Muntahari, which of them? No, it might be Muntahari. No, no, one second. Brothers, one second. I'll get the link. Sardar, can you send me the link right now? We can pin it up because it's taking too much time here. So, guys, this is okay. not, I feel like this is not acceptable every time I, I speak. and then you, you Yeah, but you don't even know who you're quoting, my friend. I do. I just told you. Al-Muntadari. I said it in the beginning. Muntadari, uh, Dirasat Wilayat al-Faqih. Is that what you said? 
Yes, and I put again. Listen. I've sent him the source. I've sent him the source, Muhammad Rafi. I've sent the source. We had a condition that in the debate you post a PDF for everything or a link, and I've done that. I fulfilled that. So I don't know why you're interrupting me now. This is not. Yeah, Muhammad Rafi, please leave it to the mods. If if you if you have an issue with the source, just just message me, and then I'll request him to share it. But I've sent you the source, so you can look at it in the back channel. Uh, and, apologies, Mr. Yeah, yeah, and there shouldn't be any need to interrupt me actually, because I'm fulfilling the criteria, the terms that we agreed to. Everything is posted, alhamdulillah, on the Discord that I'm citing and that I'm referencing, with the link to the PDF that you can download. So there really is no need to interrupt me. Unless I'm violating any well, uh, Super, but whenever you're ready, uh, Brother Aziz, uh, just give him a few additional seconds, if that's okay with you, Muhammad Rafid, for that interruption. Inshallah, Brother Super. I'm this is the second time. This is very unusual. Two times in my... For the first time, I've been interrupted two times in the same debate. This is very unusual for me. So forgive my uh, my astonishment here. Um, we're, get, we're getting we're getting close. We're getting close to the end, Inshallah. And uh, <clears throat> I just uh, want you to know. Uh, I stopped the timer at 147.17. Uh, brother of Islamic requested that you have an extra. Yeah, 10 seconds yeah. or 15 yeah. seconds. 15 yeah. seconds further. Yeah, and, and please, like, if, if, if this happens again, either he forfeits the debate or he loses his time or something, because I've never ever had a debate. Yeah, brother before. Muhammad, please. Uh, no interruptions. Yeah. If you have any issues, we're message me. Yeah, this is a formal moderated debate. This is not a discussion. No, no, you raise a valid point, brother. You, you did not interrupt him. Inshallah, this is the last time. After this, uh, my opponent forfeits the debate or he loses a significant portion of his time, inshallah. I hope. If the moderators are fair, inshallah. Inshallah. As um, soon as you start, I, I'll start the timer for you. Jazakallah khair. Um, yes, so so yeah, I, I, I start now. So the the scan, alhamdulillah, everything is provided. These are the words of Ali radiallahu anhu, and there's no evidence to suggest that he's referring to the wilayat al faqih al Khamenei or Khomeini or, or whatever. This hadith is refer referring to <coughs> the the Imam. The, for the the wording, alhamdulillah, I've also posted the Arabic with the highlighted portion that's relevant uh, for his convenience. Um, now, with regards to the jarh that my opponent is trying to do on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he's trying to do his own jarh and his own interpretation of, of the character of Ali radiallahu anhu attempting. Uh, type of character assassination. We will come to that. We will come to that, inshallah, and show how all that is invalid. Uh, but before we do that, um, he's trying to make a condition, condition which I think is very amusing. And I want to direct all of the audience their attention to this condition that he's made. Yes? The Imam, the Khalifa, should not be a coward. Yes? The Imam, the Khalifa, should not be a coward, somebody who fears for his life. Um, if my opponent is consistent with this methodology, simple question, and I think everybody here, alhamdulillah, they know the question that I'm going to ask. Everybody knows. But where is the Imam of your time? Your current Imam, where is he? And for what reason is he where he is? For what reason? Is it because he's taking a nap or is it because he's fearful of his life? And I'm not insulting him. I'm not insulting him. This is the, I'm not calling him, you know, these words that you use for, for, for Abu Bakr, I'm not, because is, I'm, I'm going to be respectful, even though you were not respectful. Yes. Where is your imam? Yes. Is he, is he fearing for his life? But by your conditions that you've created, now your imam cannot be a, a valid imam. Yes. So be consistent. Be a little bit consistent with your methodology and understand that this is not a condition. But anyways. And the question is about legitimacy of his khilafah. You're going to shoot yourself in the foot if you say that, you know, having fear for your life at any point in your in time uh, precludes you from being a, a, a khalifa. Uh, then, then your imam for sure is not an imam, alhamdulillah. Um, now, with regards to the ayah, the ayah that you've referenced, 49, uh, Surah 49, ayah 2. Uh, okay, uh, if we just read the beginning part of the ayah, alhamdulillah, uh, we know the quality of people that this uh, ayah is referring to, yes? Because again, alhamdulillah, we see ta'adil, we see ta'adil, an affirmation of the imam uh, of the iman of the people that Allah is speaking to. Ya amanu. So the question now to my opponent is Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu a believer? Yes or no? This is this is against your worldview. It's again twelve verism versus the Quran. Your 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 religion is at odds with the Quran again. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is clearly a believer per this ayah. If this ayah is addressed to him, because Allah addressed to him, addresses the, the people of the ayah mm, with the term Khalifa. Now, uh, sorry, with the term Ya Yuhaladin Amanu. Now the, the last thing. The ta'adil, uh, sorry, the, the jarh that you're trying to do with Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu based on these various hadith and so on and so forth. Uh, this is all goes out the window because we have the ta'adil of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu mutawatir in our books by none other than Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam. He does ta'adil of uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. And alhamdulillah, again, consistent with the conditions that we have uh, made, I posted all the scan, uh, sorry, not all, numerous, a small portion, a small portion of the ahadith and the chains that exist for this famous riwayah which completely debunks your religion. Uh, where Ali radiallahu anhu says, the best of this ummah after Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam are Abu Bakr and Umar. Khayru hadhihi ummah. Ba'ad nabiha. Abu Bakr, Umar, Umar. We have uh, Ali radiallahu anhu narrating this on multiple occasions, in fact. On multiple occasions. <coughs> Five minutes remaining. Jazakallah khair. He says, <coughs> uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafi, the son of Ali, the son of Ali ibn Abi Talib says, who are the best people after Allah's messenger? This is the first time that he said this. Uh, the, the first instance, uh, or one of the instances. Is, um, Abu Bakr, and then who? He said Umar. I was afraid he would say Uthman, so I said, then you? He said, I am only an ordinary person. And this is from Sahih al-Bukhari. This is the ta'adil <coughs> that Ali radiallahu anhu does of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. So if you're going to say that he's, a, you know, he's not worthy of the khilafah, well, according to Ali, he is the best of the ummah. This is contrary, again, this is, alhamdulillah, this is another hadith that completely destroys your religion. Um, and then while he was khalifa himself, so uh, you know, I don't understand how the khalifa now is being taqiyya. When Ali has been given bay'ah by everyone uh, under his jurisdiction, in Iraq and so on and so forth, 
uh, he's now saying openly, right? That Khairu had Ummah Nabi Abu Bakr Umar. He says this on multiple occasions, and Alhamdulillah, every time we have multiple chains. So we have a plethora, we have like an, an insane amount of chains for this uh, hadith, uh, which he said multiple times. That's mutawatir to Ali ibn Abi Talib, and it's mutawatir uh, uh, in the sense that he said it multiple times, and each of those times we have multiple chains for it. So uh, whatever, ar whatever pathetic argument you were trying to make, that oh, he's a coward and he's this and he's that, uh, I think that's, that's, that's all thrown out the window when we have ta'adil from his contemporary himself, who you believe to be uh, an infallible imam. So all of your, uh, you know, your character assassination that you were attempting is, is really, truly irrelevant. Let's see. Um, yeah, so inshallah, if you want to continue with the character assassination, um, please respond to Hadith al and explain how, 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 uh, how this uh, fits with, with the rest of the, uh, with the uh, narrations that, that you've brought. Um, I think that's it, inshallah. We can move to the next phase of the debate, inshallah. Okay. Sorry, just to interject um, earlier, your comment in regards to Imam Mahdi taking a nap, that was actually an insult. It would be considered as an insult. I wasn't, I, I really didn't mean it insultingly. I meant that there's no logical alternative to other than... Yeah, yeah but, but is it a derogatory term or insult, you know, even, even if it's a form of debate. And uh, I had a question in regards to the mutawatir. What do you mean by the tabaqat al-ula? Is it ahad or is it mutawatir for you? Tabaqat al-ula? No. Are you asking about the hadith that I referenced? Yeah. The hadith that I referenced uh, is mutawatir to Ali radiallahu anhu. He said it on multiple occasions. Sure, no problem. So the uh, Rafat, go ahead. Yeah, say Rafat, please continue, please, brother, no interruptions. Okay, so I'm going to touch, you know, on a few points. And inshallah, you know, when we get to the stage whereby I will respond to his other questions. Of course, I'm not in a rush because I have so many uh, points to state, so I want to use my time. Brother, uh, brother Muhammad, before you start, <clears throat> I just want to clarify this. So this 15-minute stage that we're starting, uh, the following one was gonna be, is going to be the conclusion. So you have this 15 minutes and one more 15 minutes. And say, similar with Brother Super, just so that you uh, are aware of your time. Okay. Um, so, you know, first of all, you know, he tried to compare Imam Mahdi alayhi salam and Abu Bakr. Now, in the case of Imam Mahdi, as in the case of the Prophet, we consider them to be ma'asumin. In other words, their protection is from Allah. I stated for you the hadith of Isma earlier on from Bukhari about the Khalifa, you know, who has to be ma'asum or who is, you know, protected by Allah. You did not even touch on that because I asked you a question. I said, is Abu Bakr ma'asum? You refused to answer that. So many points I have mentioned, you did not touch. You cannot prove your Khilafah. You want to prove Wilayat al-Faqih instead of talking about Khilafah. You want to go to Kitab Sulaim. All this because you don't have a basis to prove your caliphate, to legitimize your, your Khalifa. You know, this is just, you know, you, you're actually dodging the point. You're swaying off topic. But it's not a problem. Now, in the case of Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, if, you know, he is actually acting on his own accord, wallah, he will be the most courageous of men. But if he is actually taken into ghaibah because he has to actually save his life, or Allah has to use that as an in instrument to save his life, it doesn't mean, you know, he's actually shaken, like the way, you know, the, the hadith I pointed out of your Khalifa, he's shaken. Then Rasul, no. Even if he's scared of his life being lost because his forefathers were poisoned or killed, this does not mean that he's a coward. You can be scared for your life by taking measures, but it doesn't mean you're shaking. You're like, no, it's a different, the, the scenario is different. Uh, Abu Bakr being a fallible leader who is supposed to be, you know, up to the task of protecting himself since, well, you don't believe he's masoom. Even the Bukhari in that hadith I mentioned, the caliph, you know, can be masoom or Allah can protect him. But he's still, you know, he's having Rasulullah and he's shaking. Now, Isa ibn Maryam, Allah saved him. So in these instances, Allah is the protector here. But in the case of Abu Bakr, if he's been, you know, a fallible leader, he's a, he's a man-made leader, he's supposed to protect you, not you protect him. That's a different, that's a different, you know, you're comparing apples and to oranges. Then, you know, you mentioned Kitab Sulaim about, you know, the Muslims having, you know, again, he's mentioning a statement of Imam Ali that is directed to Muawiyah. In other words, Muawiyah wanted revenge, the so-called revenge for the blood of Osman before even a leader. The same thing with Aisha, before a leader was actually chosen. He's telling them, you know, since the Khilafah was been was, has been taken away from him, he's telling them about the importance of choosing a leader. That at least, you know, you people, before you can do anything that is actually legitimate, you should actually, you know, have a leader who will, you know, execute issues based on the laws of Allah. Again, he's trying to make it seem as if, oh, you know what? Imam Ali is saying you should choose a leader. No, this is not. Imam Ali, he's place, placing hujjah upon them. It is the same thing in sermon number six of Nahjul Balagha. Imam Ali is using the precedence that has been set, and he's telling them that this is hujjah upon you. I am obliging you to follow the precedence that is already set in my favor. This is what he's saying. He's not telling them that, oh, you know what, Rasulullah did not appoint me. No, because in one of your hadiths, I can recall, but I can get it for you if you wish. The first thing he did when he arrived at Kufa is to actually make people to testify what they had at Ghadir. This is fine, I think, in Musnad Ahmed. If I'm not mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, I can't recall exactly. So you don't hold my word for it. He actually made sure they testify that what they had Rasulullah say at Ghadir Khum. You know, but you know, all these gimmicks that you're actually trying to throw in, it's not going to work, you know. And the Afdaliyah, you know, the, oh, it is mutawatir about uh, Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiyah. I am going to suffocate you on that point. That is why I'm not touching on it. I will hold you on this. 
that I'm going to hold you on this. Well, the time will come for that, you know, in the cross examination. So I'm not going to touch it. You can keep, you know, crying that, oh, he has not touched this. I will not touch it. I am waiting for the right time. You know, I will go on. I will continue with my points. Let us scrutinize, you know, Abu Bakr, because he is supposed to be, you know, the Imam here. You know, I stopped, you know, at Uhud when, you know, he, he actually, you know, um, he actually, you know, sorry, I, I mentioned Uhud, then I mentioned from the Mawatta of uh, Malik, uh, Exhibit 29, Book of Jihad, Hadith number 21, when uh, Rasulullah refused to testify for, for him, he said, Abu Bakr said, are we not their brothers? We entered Islam as they entered Islam and we did jihad as they did jihad. The messenger, may Allah's uh, mercy and blessings be upon him uh, and his family. He said, but I do not know what you will do after me. In Jami'a at tirmidhi uh, exhibit number 30, Jami' al tirmidhi 2193, Rasulullah, quoted by Ibn Abbas, said, do not revert to disbelief after me. Some of you striking the necks of others. Now you may ask me, we go to another fundamental issue. Did Abu Bakr strike the necks of Muslims? Did he commit crimes against humanity on his supposed fellow Muslims? The answer is yes, as I will show you just shortly. And this goes to show Abu Bakr was not an upright and just man, and his righteousness and uprightness are to be called into question. In Sunan Nasai 3973, exhibit number 30, it, it was narrated by, that Abu Huraira said when the messenger of Allah died and Abu Bakr became Khalifa after him and the Arabs, quote and unquote, uh, reverted to Kufr, Umar said, oh Abu Bakr, can you fight the people when the messenger said, I have been commanded to fight the people until they say la ilaha illallah and whoever says la ilaha illallah, his wealth and his life are safe from me except for a right due, a right that is due and his reckoning will be with Allah, the mighty and sublime. Abu Bakr said, I will fight whoever separates salah and zakah for zakah is the compulsory right to be taken from wealth by Allah. If they withhold from me a young goat that they used to give to the messenger of Allah, I will fight them for withholding it. You know, he's fighting for the dunya. Umar said, by Allah, as soon as I saw that uh, uh, Allah has expanded the chest of Abu Bakr, he always, you know, Umar always interprets what Allah means. You know, Allah, you know, uh, saved us from the evils of Saqifa. Uh, Allah expanded the chest of Abu Bakr as if he's receiving wahi. You know, he goes on to say, Allah has expanded the chest of Abu Bakr to fight him. I knew that it was the truth, mashallah, wahi, revelation. So from this narration, it can be observed that Umar was informing Abu Bakr, those people he wanted to fight were believers and not disbelievers. Because he's telling Abu Bakr that whoever you know says la ilaha illallah, you should not fight him. Abu Bakr apparently conceded to that because he affirmed by saying he doesn't make distinction between those who offer salah and do not give zakah as disbelievers. A point, you know, a gimmick you shouldn't play here is to tell me, oh, you know what? They were denying zakah to be part of the religion. That is false. They did not deny zakah as a tenet. They refused to pay it to Abu Bakr because they did not find him deserving. It is therefore incumbent upon my opponent to provide a single verse from the Holy Quran or the Hadith, another, another challenge you will not prove, you will pretend you never heard. You should provide a verse from the Hadith to defend your Khalifa, whereby it can be justified that not paying zakat makes one an apostate who should be killed. I definitely wouldn't want to be, you know, under such a takfiri caliph who makes the blood of Muslims permissible because of his pocket. On the prohibition of killing anyone who has stated the testimony of faith and regarding him as a believer whose blood and wealth are made sacrosanct, we read the following Hadith. In Bukhari, 6865, 6866, uh, Exhibit 32, an ally of Bani Zuhra, who took part in the battle of Badr with the Prophet, that he said, Oh Allah's Apostle, if I meet an unbeliever and we have a fight and he strikes my hand with the sword and cuts it off and then takes refuge from me under a tree and says, I have surrendered to Allah or embraced Islam, may I kill him after he has said so? Allah's messenger said, Do not kill him. Al Maghdad said, Oh, oh uh, but oh Allah's messenger, he had chopped off my hands and he said that after he had cut it off. May I kill him? The Prophet said, do not kill him, for if you kill him, he will be in the position in which you had been before you kill him. And you will be in the position in which he was before. In other words, you become a kafir if you kill a Muslim, basically, or you commit kufr, whichever way. If a faithful believer conceals his faith, Islam from the disbelief, uh, if a faithful believer conceals his, his faith, Islam from the disbelievers, and then when he declares his Islam, you kill him, you will be sinful. Remember that you were also concealing your faith at Makkah. So in Bukhari 6872, narrated Usama ibn Zaid, Allah's messenger sent us to fight against Huraqa, one of the sub-tribes of Juhayna. We reached those people in the morning and defeated them. A man from the Ansar. Morning. And I chased their men. Then he goes on to say, you know, uh, that the person had actually uttered the shahada and then Usama killed the man. So Rasulullah was ahead about this. Then Rasulullah said, you killed him after he had said, non, la ilaha illallah. Rasulullah kept saying, repeating this statement till I wished I had not been a Muslim before that day. Ibn Hazm, he said, the people of Ridda were two groups. One group were those who never believed like the followers of Musaylam and Sajjah. Uh, these were the people of war and did not want to submit at all. And there is no dispute that their repentance and conversion to Islam was acceptable if they wanted to repent and accept Islam. The other group were Muslims and did not apostate after their acceptance of Islam. But they refused to pay zakat to Abu Bakr and that is why he fought them. Exhibit number 34, Ibn Hazm al-Muhalla, volume 11, page 193. This statement of Ibn Hazm destroys all claims that those against Abu Bakr, whom Abu Bakr fought, were exclusively Ahlul Ridda, people of apostasy. Because the first group mentioned by Ibn Hazm were those who never believed. So how can they, you know, be called people of apostasy when they were not Muslims ever? And the second group mentioned by Ibn Hazm were Muslims who did not apostate but refused to pay zakat. So how can they be called people of Ridda or apostasy, apostasy when they never apostated? The conclusion is that neither of these two particular groups mentioned specifically these two groups of people against whom Abu Bakr fought were apostates, as they claimed to be. Abu Bakr added to the laws of Allah by legislating by himself, spreading facade on earth and tyranny, and he made he made the shedding of the blood of the Muslims permissible. Remember, as far the Holy Quran 
4213, only Allah has the right to legislate. Sheikh Ibn Baz said, this is exhibit number 35 from his website, Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah believe the disobedient one is not a kafir, just as the fornicator and the thief. He who abandons zakat or does not fast during the month of Ramadan or does not perform hajj while able is not a kafir. This is what Ibn Baz is saying. Ibn Hajar, he said, Malik Ibn Nuwayra, Ibn Jamra, Ibn Ibn Ibn, then he, go, he mentions you know, his lineage, then he said, he was a poet, he mentioned rather, he was a poet, honorable, a knight, counted among the knights of Banu Yarbur during the days of ignorance, and he was amongst the noble ones of his tribe. He was a representative of kings, the Prophet appointed him to collect sadaqa from his people. When the Prophet passed away, Malik withheld the arms from Abu Bakr and gave it back to his people. Ibn Habban said, those who were appointed, uh, this is Exhibit 37, Ibn Hibban, at thuqat Volume 2, page 144 to 145. Those who were appointed by Allah's Messenger to collect the arms until his death were Uday, he mentioned all those, then one of them was Malik Ibn Nuwayra, Ibn Abdul, Abdul Bar, Exhibit number 38, Ibn Abdul Bar Al-Isti'ab, Volume 3, page 1362, Person 2303, Ibn Abdul Bar said, there is disagreement about Malik. Did Khalid kill him as a Muslim or a Murtad? In my opinion, Khalid made a mistake in killing him, and Allah knows best. Definitely one of the most severe sins found in the Holy Quran is shedding the blood of the innocent believer in 493. But whoever kills a believer intentionally, his recompense is hell, wherein he will abide eternally, and Allah has become angry with him and has cost him and has prepared for him a great punishment. 532, because of that, we decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul unless for his soul or corruption in the land, it is as if he has slain mankind entirely, and whoever saves one, it is as if he has saved mankind entirely. And our messengers had certainly come to them with clear proofs, then indeed, indeed many of them, even after that throughout the land, were transgressors. So this clearly shows that Abu Bakr actually shed remaining. the blood of the Muslims, and therefore this is tyranny in Sahih Muslim. Sorry, Sahih Bukhari 60, 44, exhibit number 39. Allah's messenger said, abusing a Muslim is fusuk, it's evil doing, and killing him is kufr. In Sunan Ibn Dawood 48, 90, 96, uh, 48, 96, the messenger was sitting with some of his companions. Uh, I will leave this for later, inshallah. This is to show you how angry Abu Bakr was. He did not have rahmah. He actually took revenge upon the people. When you contrast this character with the character of the prophets in the Quran, that the prophet was not, you know, hard-hearted. He was lenient with the believer, believers. He was very lenient with, with the believers. He, was, he showed them, you know, mercy and all that. I want to compare it with this hadith in Sunan Abi Dawood. And then you will see how this man was actually very vengeful. Sunan Abi Dawood, uh, 4896, right. exhibit number 40, how he took revenge against somebody who... Assaulted him. Okay, time. Brother Aziz, is it, is it my turn? Uh, yes, Brother Super. You have 15 minutes. Okay. I'll start the timer as soon as he starts speaking. Jazakallah khair. Okay, so we're going to try to, inshallah, address everything here. Um, his question, he claims that I'm uh, he claims that I'm avoiding the question. It's Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu ma'asum. Uh, <laughs> of course, I'm not avoiding the question. In fact, from Ahlul Sunnah, I don't think anybody believes that Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is an infallible imam of Farhus ma'asum individually. Now, people might say that the Ijma'a of the Sahaba, Ijma'a of Khulafa Rashidin is infallible, but we don't say this about Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu individually. Not one person from Ahlul Sunnah say it. So this is the first thing that he's, uh, you know, he's saying, uh, allegedly, I'm avoiding. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, I'm not in your shoes where I have to avoid certain arguments like Hadith al and so on and so forth. I have to just completely, you know, pretend like they don't exist. Every argument that you're making, in fact, I try to address the best ones because the ones that are weaker, inshallah, are, you know, if, if I don't have time to address them, at least the audience can see that the, anything that could possibly give them a shubha is, is based on nothing. Um, with regards to the hadith uh, from Sahih al-Bukhari uh, by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri about uh, Allah never gives the Prophet, Allah never sent the Prophet or gives the uh, Caliphate to a Caliph, but that he and the Prophet of the Caliph has two groups of advisors, a group advising him to do good and exhorting him to do it, and the other group advising him to evil and exhorting him to do it. But the protected person against uh, such evildoers is the one protected by Allah. Again, the hadith that you referenced, in the, uh, even the translators of the hadith, uh, I believe it's abundantly clear how to interpret this. It's referring to uh, protection from evildoers. Yes, this is not uh, asma in, 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 the, in the way that you understand it. When Allah says, Allah, and this is referring to, uh, again, the context of the ayah is, is very clear. Allah is telling the Prophet to do balagha of, of the mission, unlike your imams did, they did taqiyya, right? they hid the religion from people. In fact, not any part of the religion. Uh, Allah says, Allah, Allah protects from, from the people. So don't censor the religion, as the, the imam of the Rafi allegedly did. Censor the religion. Somebody comes to the imam and says, are you the imam Ma'asum? He says, no, I'm not. You know, don't, don't do what the Rafi claimed that their imams did. And of course, the imams are free from what, what you ascribe to them. Uh, but this is this is what it's referring to. Allah protects them from from, uh, from evil doers. This is the first point. The second point you made was something from Kitab Sulaim. I don't recall in this debate uh, citing anything from Kitab Sulaim. I don't recall. Um, in fact, what I referenced was a hadith from Ali radiallahu anhu um, from a book called Dirasat fi Wulayat al Faqih, uh, where Ali radiallahu anhu says, again, you keep referring to uh, Kitab Sulaim. It's not from Kitab Sulaim. I, I don't believe I've referenced Kitab Sulaim in this debate. 
uh, and the, mat the mandatory matter in the judgment of Allah and the Islam over the Muslims after their Imam dies is killed or is killed, it is not from them to make an event or innovate in innovation or spread false beliefs. Rather, they are to pick for themselves a pious Imam knowledgeable and pious, aware of the judiciary and the Sunnah, and unite their affairs. Yes. Oh, my, my, my apologies, my apologies. This, this, my apologies. I, I, yes, so, the, so the, the, the book that it comes from is the Rasat Fi Wulat al but yes, uh, it does come from Kitab Sunnah. So I withdraw that. I withdraw that point. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it does originate in Kitab Sunnah. Um, my apologies, I was reading the wrong part. Um, you, you keep saying that it's about Wilayat al-Faqih and that I'm trying to be up Wilayat al-Faqih. Nowhere in the hadith does it reference Wilayat al-Faqih. So I'm trying to understand. If you're saying that it's coming from Wilayat al-Faqih, you have to have a basis for that. You have to have a basis for that. Um, then you say that you're going to suffocate me, allegedly. You're going to suffocate me on hadith al-Baliyah. Uh, Habibi, if you're going to suffocate me, I'm waiting for the time because the debate is almost over. Your only time to speak now is in the conclusion. I made the argument in the introduction, in my opening statement. I have never seen a debate where somebody waits until the conclusion to give a response to something I gave in the opening. I made it very easy for you, Habibi. I made it very, very easy. Very easy. I said that you just have a couple of arguments. In the beginning, I presented four arguments for you to respond to. Out of those, you're saying that you're one of the, one of the core four arguments I made in this, I don't know, two, three-hour debate, you're going to respond to only in the, in the conclusion. SubhanAllah. This is, again, another, there are many firsts of this debate. First time I've been interrupted two times in the same, first time I've been interrupted at all in a formal debate. But again, first time, mashallah, where my opponent is going to wait till his conclusion to actually address something I, I addressed in the opening remarks. Bye -bye. <laughs> like, for the audience, I want, you, I want you to be the judge now. Audience, you be the judge. Who is upon Haqqa? Who's upon Babel? Have you ever heard of this before? I'm only going to respond to the argument that you made in the opening statement in the conclusion. SubhanAllah. This is, uh, this is something else. Hadith Abdaliya, this is one of my core, uh, core arguments against you. Instead of responding to it, you just keep going on and on and changing the topic, shifting the goalposts. The topic of the debate is the legitimacy of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr Siddiq. Not, okay, can we find all these character assassination points and can Subhanallah respond to them? And uh, did Abu Bakr do the right thing with, with uh, enforcing the, the Hukum of Rida on the people who, who didn't pay zakah? But on the issue of zakah, let's get to that. Because again, although it's not the topic of the debate, this is the only thing that your, your last resort, once you realize that you cannot prove the topic of the debate, you're going to shift the goalposts. Alhamdulillah, it is abundantly clear for the audience whether the proposition of uh, which is uh, which is the title of this debate has been proven by you or by me. Yes, but I will entertain your your your, your attempt to, to save face by changing the topic and hoping the audience will notice. I'm pointing out, so inshallah, I hope they notice that the opponent is changing the topic. And inshallah, even the topic to which you've changed the debate to, I will defeat you on that as well, as I defeated you on the on the original topic. Yes, uh, you make this claim about zakah. Uh, if you look at a book called Aqaid al Islam by Al Majlisi. Uh, we can see that uh, actually I don't have the reference. I don't have the page reference for that, so I will not cite it. Um, although it is in the in the I posted the PDF, it is in there somewhere. Let me try to get the uh, sorry page. I, I do have the page now. It's page fifty three to fifty four in this book, which I posted the, the PDF for, uh, where the message he says that just know who rejects what has been approved uh, from Usul al Din and that is public to all the Muslims, they deserve to be killed. This Usul has to be done just like Salah giving zakah. Yes. So this is this is from your books. This is from your books from your religion that the one who does not give zakah should be unalive. Yes. So this is. Uh, <laughs> You're criticizing Abu Bakr for doing what you would say is, is the correct thing to do. SubhanAllah, the hypocrisy. And we know, and we know through the numerous narrations what your 12th Imam is going to do to the people who don't give zakah, who don't give him bay'ah, and so on and so forth. Yes, we know what your 12th Imam is going to do to these people. So you're criticizing Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu for doing something that your Imam, who doesn't even exist, uh, is allegedly going to be doing in, in, in your books. SubhanAllah. Um, let's see. Again, I want to say again, I want to say, uh, when, yeah, so when, yeah, so when the, when the, when the, when the 12th Imam comes, is going to strike the necks of the people who do not give zakah. Yeah, so this is this is your religion, and, and, and you're criticizing Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu for doing the same thing. Um, let's see. Um, the topic. Uh, so again, we're, we're, just to clarify, we have changed the topic now to can super. The, the topic of the debate is now can super Amr defend against the random character assassination that Muhammad Rafi was trying to do on Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Alhamdulillah, because we've already established that uh, the khilaf of Abu Bakr Siddiq is legitimate. We've, we've just changed the topic to the same topic. Inshallah, we're going we're gonna to address that uh, now. Um, was there anything else that you said? No. The hadith is not about Milat al-Faqih. He's going to suffer in I'm still waiting for that response. Um, Just before I yield the rest of the time, I want to make sure that I've addressed everything that you, you brought up. <coughs> Brother, you have at least five more minutes. Okay, yeah, I'm just, I'm just thinking, I'm just thinking, because uh, I don't want anyone to say that you avoided the, the argument. Alhamdulillah, I want to make sure that I've given a thorough response to everything. Uh, because I think the case has already been made on my side. Now you have five minutes um, remaining. What I'll do is I'll, yeah, I'm, I'm going to use it, inshallah. Uh, 
Okay, here we go. Um, and, and what we're going to do, inshallah, is I just want to remind, do a quick recap of, of some of the arguments that have been uh, withdrawn and changed during the, over the course of the debate. Um, the opponent, he asserted that a group of sahaba came to Aisha, radiallahu anha, um, and, and asked if uh, the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, appointed Ali, and then he retracted from that from sahaba to tabi'in. So is he going to apologize to the people now for misleading them, for, for saying sahaba when it was actually uh, tabi'in, that's all that he can prove? Um, he said that I lied about Muhammad Jawad Muhniya. Is he going to, and again, he has yet to come out and openly state with his chest, yes, that I am throwing Muhammad Jawad Muhniya under the bus. I'm waiting for him to prove that, inshallah. Um, we have uh, another evidence, uh, in fact, inshallah, from uh, from a book called Muhadhib Fi Fiqh Al Shafi by Al Shirazi. Um, that from uh, which says that and if a person uh, prevented something from the Sharia, he gets fought by his Imam uh, because Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu fought the preventers of zakat. So this is consistent within our methodology of Ahlul Sunnah. That giving zakat is in fact a, a valid reason for um, uh, fighting the one who, who does that. Because our our religion is consistent. In fact, my opponent, if he criticizes this, then he's criticizing his own religion because this is something in, in his religion as well. Um, The PDF is actually a ridge that all scans to be accompanied by a PDF or links to the PDFs. Um, oh, and translation. Um, and yeah, I guess uh, I guess I'm uh, you know just apologies to the, to the audience. I guess we're gonna have a debate where you know he says he's gonna suffocate me on the Hadith Abdullah. I guess we'll have to wait now because after this it's gonna be concluding remarks. And so I guess, inshallah, the, the awaited master response to Hadith Abdullah is going to be in the conclusion. So I'll just uh, give my opponent that chance, inshallah, and then, and then uh, since he started, I'll, I will give, be the last one to give concluding remarks. Um, and so, yeah, I guess, but, but warning to the audience, don't hold your breath. I don't think it's going to be anything uh, worth waiting for. But we'll, we'll go ahead and wait for the response to Hadith Abdullah in my opponent's concluding remarks. I yield the rest of my time. Uh, okay, so now we're going to be starting the last 15-minute section for each, uh, for the conclusions. Please try to focus on closing down uh, any points that was raised, addressing them. Uh, and then if you have remaining time or your strategy is to open up uh, further points for your, your opponent, this is the conclusion. So it's the last 15 minutes you'll have. Uh, Brother Muhammad, as soon as you start, I'll start your timer. Okay, um, thank you. Like, as you can see, you know, this guy, he has done everything. He has moved from Wilayat al-Faqih to Kitab Sulaim. Uh, to Allah, like, he has moved to everything about Shiism. But one thing he has not done, he cannot do, he will not do, he will never do, is to prove that the Khilafah of Abu Bakr is Sharia. It has basis in the Quran and the Sunnah. Even though it is obligatory upon him to follow his Khilafah, or at least, you know, when he's asking me, you know, where is the Imam of your time, you know? Well, if you go, for example, to Ahlul Sunnah Hadith, you check, for example, the role of the Mahdi. It says the role of the Mahdi, he will fill the earth with justice and equity as it was filled with tyranny and injustice. In other words, the purpose, the main purpose of Imam Mahdi, alayhi salam, the main purpose, so I'm not misquoted here, the main purpose of the Imam is not to teach you Salah or to teach you Saum or to teach you, for example, Ghusl. His main mission is to establish the divine government on the earth. We had a history of about 300 years of Masumin from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi up till Imam Hassan al-Askari. They taught us how to pray, how to do zakah, how to do khums, everything that has to do with the a'mal, everything that has to do with fiqh. When it has to do with Imam Mahdi alayhi salam, his mission will be to establish the divine government of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth. And this is the same thing you find in the Sunni hadith. But you know, I would have to ask you, do you have bay'ah on your neck or are you dying the death of jahiliyyah? You know, I have bay'ah on my neck, the bay'ah is to the 12th Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. But what about you? When I mentioned, for example, the case of Abu Bakr bin a, well, a coward, he said, oh, well, your Imam is in Ghaiba. So now, imagine Imam Mahdi is in Ghaiba and he's still shaken. Do you think he will be deserving of being called an Imam? Of course not. You have somebody in the presence of Rasulullah and he was still shaken, literally, physically, he was shaken. No, the Imam is in Ghaiba. If he's scared, he's in Ghaiba. Allah is protecting him. Allah is shading him. But imagine how much of kufr it will be if even though, you know, Allah is actually protecting him, he's still afraid, he's still shaken. Will that be, you know, befitting of an Imam? Of course not. You know, you went to so many other issues, you know, uh, for example, uh, the issue of uh, the issue of Afdaliyya. Well, it's very simple, you know, it's very, very simple. If you go to Muslim uh, 1751, sorry, let me just open the hadith, you know, because this was supposed to come, you know, uh, later. But anyway, I will I will open sorry, it now. Sorry, Shay, sorry, Shay, which exhibit number is this? Uh, it's I, I don't know, but leave it out. I'm not mentioning it in my in my presentation, so I will just give it randomly. So if you go actually to Sahih Muslim, uh, 1757, you know, he mentions taqiyya and he's trying to mock taqiyya. Well, this is an, actually, it, it's either this is a, a clear evidence of taqiyya in Sunni hadith, or this is a clear evidence of fabrication. You know, you have a very clear hadith, Muslim 1757c. How did Imam Ali, alayhi salam, according to Umar ibn al-Khattab, how did he view Abu Bakr? How? Sinful? 
treacherous, dishonest liar. This this account of Imam Ali alone, you know, this is actually this should actually you know make you to dissociate yourself from Abu Bakr. This is a very which jarh and do you want worse than this? This is the worst jarh and ta'adil in the history of Islam. There is no other hadith that contains uh, this terminologies. And you're talking here of one caliph regarding the other. And you know, I want to listen to what you have to say about, you know, what Al-Abbas is saying here, you know. I told you I will suffocate you. So for you to come and tell me there is, you know, one fabricated Sunni hadith from Ibn al Hanafiya or attributed to him, you should be ashamed. This is what you find in, in Sahih Muslim. This is what your fourth caliph, how he's describing your, fifth, your, fifth, your first caliph. He's calling him sinful, treacherous, dishonest liar. And not only that, if you go to another hadith, who was the most beloved to Allah and Rasulullah? I think this is in Al-Tirmidhi, if I'm not mistaken. Um, let, me, let me just quickly check here. Uh, this is uh, reported by Anas ibn Malik, uh, Al-Tirmidhi 3721. There was a bed with the Prophet, so he said, Oh Allah, send to me the most beloved of your creatures to eat this bed with me. So Ali came and ate it with him. So what more, you know, Jarhan Ta'adil, for you to realize, you know, who was the best and who wasn't the best? You have to realize that the problem is essentially in your books. You have a corrupt history, whereby, you know, the Tayyib and the, you know, what is good and what is not good have actually been mixed up. This is not my fault, you know. You keep, you know, bringing in Topics that are very, you know, unrelated to our discussions because you cannot prove your case. This is the problem here. You bring, for example, the issue of, you know, zakat. If somebody denies that zakat is a part of religion, yeah, he becomes a kafir. But based on what your scholars are saying, the, the account I have read, if they refuse to pay it, not because they actually do not believe it is part of the religion, it is more or less withholding it, not denying it, then the person is not a kafir. Then you mentioned Majlisi. Majlisi didn't say that. Then you mentioned the hadith, you know, about the Mahdi, alayhi salam. What does the hadith say? Can you dare to read it? I know, like, I prepared myself with this hadith before I came here. It says, these are two sins in Islam whose punishment will not be given in this world before the reappearance of the Mahdi, alayhi salam. In other words, your Khalifa does not have the legitimacy. There is no precedence for him in Islam, for him to do this. So where, 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 on what basis, on what basis, which hadith do you have from Bukhari, from Muslim in the Quran, whereby Abu Bakr is placing his ruling, he's basing his ruling, that those that do not pay me zakat, not because they are not Muslims or they deny it being part of the religion, something you cannot prove. Where does it say that he's basing his ruling, his legislation on? Where? You have to show me this. You will never do it again. I will continue doing my jarh and ta'adil on Abu Bakr. Let's see if this guy is actually befitting to be, you know, the Khalifa. You know, let's see. For example, um, I just mentioned, you know, Imam Ali doing jarh and ta'adil of him, calling him, you know, a sinful, dis, uh, dishonest, uh, treacherous liar. I will give you another exhibit. For example, was he truthful? Was he, you know, a truthful person? Exhibit number 43, from the Mawatta of Malik, under Kitab al-Kalam, hadith number 56. Malik related to me from Zaid ibn Aslam, from his father, that Umar ibn al-Khattab came upon Abu Bakr, pulling his tongue. Why was he pulling his tongue? Umar said to him, stop. May Allah forgive you. Abu Bakr replied, this, meaning his tongue, has brought me to dangerous places. Oof, no more as siddiq what happened? Was he a kind person? You know, oftentimes we hear how Sunnis make mention of Abu Bakr spending in the path of Islam and freeing Bilal as an example. This is exhibit number 44, Sahih Bukhari 3755. Bilal said to Abu Bakr, if you have bought me for yourself, then keep me for yourself. But if you have bought me for Allah's sake, then leave me for Allah's work. Leave me alone, Abu Bakr. This is what Bilal is telling him. You know, stop pretending that you freed me for the sake of Allah while you're using me. It's, it's either I do the work of Allah or I do the work of Abu Bakr. So let me go even further to show his corruption. A clear, a clear, you know, example of his corruption. Exhibit number 45, Tabaqat al-Kubra of Ibn Sa'ad, volume 3, page 182. It reads, when, Abu Bakr got, when people gathered on the caliphate of Abu Bakr, he divided money for the people. He sent a share to an old woman from Banu Uday, Ibn Najjar, with Zaid ibn Thabit. She asked Zaid, what is this? Zaid replied, a share of what Abu Bakr divided for the women. She responded, are you bribing me from my religion? She was told no. So she asked again, are you afraid that I may abandon the path I am on? She was told no. So she said, by Allah, I will not accept anything from it. Zaid ibn Thabit returned it to Abu Bakr and he told him what happened. A woman, you know, a noble woman of dignity, she's refusing to be bribed. You know, given, given, you know, let's even, you know, let's even examine how did Abu Bakr himself view himself? You know, was he up to the task in Tabakat, uh, Tabakat al Kubra, you know, in volume three, page 212? Um, I did not, you know, I did not label this as any exhibit, but this is the reference here. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. No, it is Exhibit 46, Tabakat al-Kubra, uh, Volume 3, 212. Uh, he said, beware that I have a devil Five that afflicts remaining. me. Five minutes How many? Five minutes remaining. Okay, thank you. So in Tabakat of Ibn Sa'ad, Volume 3, page 212, he said, beware that I have a devil that afflicts me. So when I am angry, avoid me so that I may not affect your goodness. A devil that afflicts him. We go to Holy Quran, Surah An-Nahl, verses 99 to 100. Indeed, there is for him, Shaitan, no authority over those who have believed and relied upon their Lord. His authority is over those only who take him as a patron and who join partners with Allah. Allahu Akbar. So why? Why does he have a Shaitan that inflicts him? He said, Shaitan 
So why is this guy you know, having a shaitan when Allah is saying shaitan doesn't have authority over those who believe and rely upon their Lord and his authority, the shaitan's authority, is only of those who take him as a patron. In Ibn Majah 2865, exhibit number 47, you know, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, the Prophet said, among those in charge of you after I am gone will be men who extinguish the sunnah and follow innovation. They will delay the prayer from its proper time. I said, oh, Messenger of Allah, if I leave to see them, what should I do? He said, you ask me, oh, Ibn, ibn Abd, or Ibn Abdullah, I think. I, I don't know if this is quoted correctly. What should you do? There is no obedience to one who disobeys Allah. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud died in the time of Osman. In other words, you cannot tell me it's the time of Muawiyah or the time you know, of Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, for example, or the time of Yazid or the time of the Ottomans. No. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he lived until the time of Osman. So who were these people that Rasulullah was telling him, you know, about? You know, Abu Hanifa, for example, he's mentioned, this is exhibit number 48, Tariq Baghdad, volume, four, uh, volume 13, page 369. Abu Hanifa is recorded to have said, the Iman of Abu Bakr and the Iman of Iblis, they are one. Abu Bakr used to say, Ya Rab, and Iblis also used to say, Ya Rab. So, you know, when we see all these examples, we go back, you know, to what, you know, Sa'ad of Tazani and Ibn Hazm, you know, the conditions they have placed for somebody to become, you know, Khalifa. Do this, does this man, you know, does he fulfill those conditions? Does he have what it takes to be the Khalifa? And you will tell me, oh, well, he lived, you know, 1,400 years ago. So please tell me, Habibi, who is your Khalifa today? Who is fulfilling these conditions? Are you dying the death of Jahiliya Super Omar? And, you know, don't forget, you know, every innovation is misguidance and every misguidance, every dalala is in the hellfire. So where are you going, Super Omar? You ask me, you know, to prove, prove your imama from the Quran. You've had an opportunity today to prove your khilafah, its legitimacy of Abu Bakr, the khilafah of Abu Bakr. You can't. And inshallah tomorrow, it's for the khilafah, for the imam of Imam Musa al-Qazim. I will show you how you can defend, how you should defend your imam, how you should actually uh, show his legitimacy. I will show you tomorrow. I will teach you, inshallah. I will teach you a lesson you will never forget. You know, and when you go to the hadith in Ibn Majah, which I started from, hadith number 43, exhibit number one. In this hadith, you have to follow the rightly guided caliphs and the rightly guided caliphs, the, the, the Khulafa al-Rashidun al mahdiyun Do you think Abu Bakr can be described as such with all the things I have mentioned, killing Muslims, bribing people, uh, bringing out his tongue, minute, with all these things, you think you can actually describe him as a Khalifa to Rashid? Can you do that? That's your last, uh, last one minute. I still have a minute. Well... Yes. Oh, mashallah. So basically, you know, he also presented the link. He, what he presented from Alam al-Majlisi is not true, by the way, you know. So I think I will conclude my statement here. He should answer me, answer my questions. He has never, he has not answered any of my questions. Not one has he answered. Nothing. He hasn't answered my question. He cannot prove that the legit legitimacy of Abu Bakr's Khilafah is from Quran or Sunnah. Nothing. It's a political office, you know, he says. Anyway, is okay. Our scholars have shown many methodologies. Are they based on the Quran? No answer. You don't have answers. Fine, this is proof fine. to you this night for you to reflect fine, fine, and see fine. the misguidance you're on, fine. for you to understand that the Khilafah... Fine. Sorry, Aziz, what's what's going on next now? So it's the last 15 minutes uh, for the conclusion from uh, Super Omar, and then we are going to have, I guess, 20 minutes Q&A, I think. No, no, I, no Q&A. I have, this, this debate went on for very long. Okay, so... Okay, no, 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 no Q&A, that's fine. Buddy. Uh, last was, that minutes, was that the last section? Was that the last 20 minutes? Or? Yes, no. yes that, that was the conclusion. That was an optional, that was the optional uh, part of the debate. Can we go one more section? No. We can't because <laughs> this is, that's not what we agreed to. I was being generous and I we lengthened the debate a lot more than we uh, initially agreed to. I, I think you need it, Super Omar. You need you need to listen to this word so you wake up. Oh, some Arab Kaaba. I don't need it. Alhamdulillah. Uh, <laughs> you're the one who needs. That's why you're begging. Okay, so what, what's the plan for me, brother Aziz? Now, what do you want to do? There, there is a remaining 15 minute uh, conclusion for brother Super Omar, and then I guess the debate is over after. You're not going to do no, the, the the direct cross examination, no? No, no. We reached the conclusion. No problem. Okay. Play it. بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين. Brothers and sisters and رافضة, we الحمد لله we came here to debate a proposition. Allah سبحانه وتعالى says in the Quran وقل جاء الحق وزهق الباطل إن الباطل كان زهقا. صدق الله العظيم. We saw today الحمد لله we witnessed the truth of Allah's speech. I I I can't think of a way to make it more clear. الحمد لله what we established on the opponent. Allah is my witness. You all are witnesses to the number of uh, arguments that my opponent ran from, completely avoided, or tried to save for the conclusion so that he could give a pathetic response in the hopes that you know it would just get brushed under the rug. And inshallah, bismillah, even his pathetic response to Hadith of Taliyah will not escape the uh, the the reign of onslaught that we will uh, rain down on on, on his arguments and prove the uh, fragility of. I'm going to conclude with inshallah nine points. Nine points. I'm going to go over uh, nine points and, and maybe a few more. 
Uh, but a few, nine that I have written down here, inshallah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to respond, conclude this debate. Okay. Number one, my opponent has dodged the saying and not adequately responded to the saying of Ali radiallahu anhu that shura is an acceptable methodology in the absence of divine appointment. He did not adequately respond to this point. Number two, out of nine points, he dodged the saying of Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, who said that all of Nahd al-Balagha is authentic and accused me of lying. He did not publicly apologize for this false accusation against me. When I misquoted, when I um, cited the, the, the books from Wulayat al-Fakhi, and then I forgot uh, from Dirasat fi Wulayat al-Fakhi, and, and forgot that, no, actually, that book was quoting from Kitab Sulaim, I came out and I said, you know, I misspoke, I apologize. My opponent has not done the same. He dodged the saying of Muhammad Jawad Mughniya, who said that all of Nahd al-Balagha is authentic, and he accused me of lying when, in fact, he was the liar. And alhamdulillah, that has been exposed today. Number three, out of nine points to conclude this debate, he falsely accused the Sahaba of telling Aisha radiallahu anha that Ali radiallahu anha was the rightful caliph. He lied. He made this accusation against the Sahaba and then he withdrew from this. He dodged the reputation. He claimed, he claimed that I changed the topic to zakah. We're all witness. All of us here are witness. Who is the one who brought the topic of zakah? You are the one. In your failed attempt at this character assassination of Abu Bakr that you had to resort to because you failed to prove the proposition of the debate, you you, you ran to your, your safe haven of, oh, maybe we can just throw these random attacks on Abu Bakr radiallahu anha. And, that, uh, and again, that failed as well. But in your attempt to, to, to change the topic, that's where you brought up Zakan. Alhamdulillah, I responded. I was not the one who changed the topic. Alhamdulillah, the recording is available. I, I expect, I don't know how Clubhouse works, but I expect one of you guys to send me the recording, inshallah. And we're going to thoroughly expose this on YouTube and on TikTok. And we're going to show who is the one who changed the topic to Zakan in this random character assassination from the agreed upon topic. Who is the one who did it? Was it me or was it my opponent? Inshallah, that will be exposed. Uh, so you dodged the reputation and this Malik bin Nawaid on all this stuff. Number five, number five, point number five mm -hmm. out of the nine points to conclude this debate. You dodged Hadith of Baliya. Okay, you said that it's mutawatir to, uh, or there's a, it's a had to Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. No, no, no. In fact, the hadith is mutawatir to Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhu. As I posted in the Discord chat, support Umar sources, which we agreed to ahead of time, there are over 40 independent chains for this hadith. It's not just Muhammad ibn Hanafiya. Many, many, many sahaba and tabi'in narrating from Ali, radiallahu anhu. And amongst them, Al Hassan and Hussein, radiallahu anhu, say the Shabab Ahlul Jannah. These are the ones there, amongst them narrating from their father in the chains that are provided. Um, also, um, I don't have the PDFs. For all of these books, uh, so you can consider that I didn't admit this as part of the debate. But the last screenshot that I shared in the in the debate sources uh, is a screenshot of a PDF of the work uh, of the work of the brothers over at twelvevershia.net, and Allah preserve them. They found over a hundred chains for this hadith. Hadith of Yes, it's, it's not just Muhammad al Hanafi. It's not a single narration. No, Alhamdulillah, it has many, 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 many chains. So you're, I told you guys, you know, don't hold your breath. I don't anticipate this response will be anything. And Alhamdulillah, I was, I was right. This pathetic response. Oh, it's it's ahad or it's it's only Muhammad al Hanafi. No, we have many, many dozens of chains for this. Alhamdulillah. Uh, your response was completely, completely annihilated. To, uh, mm -hmm. we waited the, you made us wait the whole debate to hear your response, and it was even more disappointing than I expected. So this was number five out of nine ways to uh, nine points that I'm making to conclude uh, this debate. Um, Alhamdulillah, again, this is point which is my, that my opponent completely changed the topic of the debate. And you guys are all witness to this. When you guys go back and, 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 and try to save face after, I, I want you to respond to these points that I'm making, these nine concise points. Point number six, the opponent completely tried to change the topic of the debate because he couldn't prove the proposition of the debate that we agreed to. He changed the topic from the legitimacy of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr to the um, random character assassination. And a pathetic attempt at, at that as well. If you go to the narration that he brought from Wattah Imam Malik, uh, if you read the chain, وَحَدَّثَنِي مَالِكْ عَنْ زَيْدْ بِنْ أَسْلَمْ عَنْ أَبِيهِ أَنَّ عَمَرْ بِنَ الْخَطَّابِ Did Malik meet Zayd bin Aslam? Or is this Hadith Mursal? So why are you citing Manasil in your... Is that how desperate you've become in this debate? It's just a short debate where you have a chance to do your, your full character assassination uh, and you're resorting to Manasil. I, I, if this is not evidence of your desperation, then wallahi, I, I don't know what is. Um, point number seven out of my nine uh, point reputation, uh, you completely avoided the and completely dodged the saying of Ali radiallahu anhu um, regarding uh, the shura is from the pleasure of Allah. Uh, point number eight, uh, you lied upon al-Majlisi who said that preventing zakah is one of the matters that require a person to be killed. And point number nine uh, is that um, that uh, you avoided the argument against the, the primary argument that I used, which is that khilafah is one of those things that you can, that if a, a specific methodology is not outlined in the Quran and the Sunnah as an amr to this ummah, then you are free to choose a methodology as long as it fits the broad set of constraints that do define it from, from Quran and Sunnah. So you avoided this, this argument as well. Alhamdulillah, the recording is there, and I hope and I hope and I pray that uh, later on, um, later on, the rafila, they, they take this recording and they try to find snippets and they try to prove me wrong in these nine points that I've summarized. I made it very easy for you. Just read, just listen to the conclusion. Go back for any of these points. Go back and clip clip where Muhammad Rafid actually addresses these points adequately. And inshallah, you will not be able to. And in that, in that exercise, you will see, you will see where the truth lies. I know it, sometimes in a debate, it's hard to pay attention for the whole length of the debate, uh, but you will see, inshallah, if you do this exercise, you will see who proved what and, and, and how, um, uh, how it was uh, addressed. Alhamdulillah, we've completely dismantled every single false allegation of claim that you've made. Your at attempts to change the topic have been exposed. Um, and yeah, you, uh, the last thing you said in your opening remark, you tried to, uh, sorry, in your concluding remarks, you said that uh, I didn't prove from Sharia. Again, as I said, you keep running back to this point. I keep responding to it. Um, 
that the khilaf of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu is not from nas. There's a broad set of constraints within which Abu Bakr, uh, within which a khilaf, uh, khalifa can be chosen, chosen, and Abu Bakr's uh, appointment fits within those broad set of constraints. Your job today was to prove how that is not the case, or that there was a specific methodology that, that was not followed, and you failed to do that. That's why, of course, and it's abundantly clear to everyone, why you changed the topic to this random character assassination. Yes, alhamdulillah. Uh, and the last, uh, I believe that's the last thing. Um, you said you said uh, that I do not answer a single one of your questions. Alhamdulillah, I, I I I know that's not true because I have a notepad in front of me and a pencil in front of me, full of false allegations that you've made, quotes from you, direct quotes that I've written down everything. And I made sure my time to respond to it. Just on on, on this page, uh, you asked is Abu Bakr Masum. I responded to that. I have I looked at through the Discord link everything that you said uh, through the Discord channel, every point that you made that agreed with the the conditions that we agreed upon before, meaning that there should be a PDF or a link provided. to a reputable website or, or and a translation available everything that met that criteria i responded to yes so i don't know how you're lying saying i didn't respond to a single thing this is a blatant lie a blatant lie um and yeah i, th I think that's it uh